Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Bull and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is 6 o'clock on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are our top stories this morning. A British citizen is believed to be amongst four foreign aid workers killed in an Israeli airstrike in Gaza, whilst footage emerges revealing the destruction of one of Gaza's hospitals after a two-week operation. The cost of chaos. Labour attacks the government's spending record, claiming the Tories have wasted more than £8 billion. But do their calculations add up? And withdrawal symptoms. As social media addiction rises, young people are suffering physically when they have their devices taken away. An unsettled and increasingly windy week. Today, chilly and wet in eastern Scotland. Scatter showers elsewhere, but there'll be more wet weather to come in the south later on. Well, now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. A British aid worker has been killed in what's reported to be an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. He's one of five volunteers for the charity World Central Kitchen who died in the attack. The others were Polish and Australian nationals. In a statement, the charity said this is a tragedy and that humanitarian aid workers should never be a target ever. Meanwhile, Israel's military has pulled out of Al-Shifa hospital after a two-week raid that has left it in ruins. Gaza's officials say dozens of bodies have been found. Israel claims to have killed 200 terrorists and detained over 500 more. It says it found weapons and intelligence. Donald Trump has posted a $175 million bond in New York to stop the state seizing his assets. The former U.S. president was given 10 days to make the payment in full if he loses an appeal in his civil fraud case. In February, he was found guilty of scheming to deceive banks and insurers by inflating his wealth. The Prime Minister has backed J.K. Rowling for misgendering transgender women in a social media post. The Harry Potter author dared police to arrest her as Scotland's new hate crime act comes into force, aiming to protect people from abusive behaviour on grounds of protected characteristics, including gender. Well, Scottish Minister Siobhan Brown says J.K. Rowling could be investigated by police for what she's done. And former political editor for The Sun, Trevor Kavner, has told Talk TV he's delighted the authors vowed to fight the legislation. She could become the very first test case to this stupid law. And with her resources and her access to the finest legal brains in the world, if not Scotland, um, will be able to contest and I think defeat any attempt to prosecute her. And an Iranian journalist who was stabbed outside his home in London has been discharged from hospital. Puria Zarati, a presenter for, Iranian inter for Iran International, is now living at a safe place with his wife under the supervision of police. The Met's Counterterrorism Command is investigating the attack. No arrests have yet been made. Those are headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. Thanks, Emily. Well, on to our top story today. A British aid worker is reportedly among five killed in an Israeli airstrike last night. Staff from Charity World Central Kitchen died when their staff was struck by a missile in Deir al-Bala. Israel's military says it is conducting a thorough review into the tragic incident. Well, Yotam Confino is the foreign editor of Jewish News UK and joins us live now from Tel Aviv. Yotam, good morning. The, the Australian Prime Minister has called for accountability from Israel for the deaths of these aid workers. Do we expect that the UK will follow suit this morning and will we get those answers? Uh, I think so, yeah. First of all, it's a tragedy, but I think it's uh, extremely important that we also stress that there needs to be an, invest an investigation into this. To conclude now that it was an Israeli uh, airstrike that killed uh, these four people, five people, 
is is simply premature. Uh, we have one medic um, witness account to go by, and he said that it was Israeli uh, missiles that hit uh, a three car convoy. First of all, if they were killed in a missile strike in their vehicle, there would be nothing left of the vehicle. I've seen uh, the bodies this morning in some of the telegram groups, and they are dead, but they are not uh, victims of a direct missile strike. That's for sure. If they were killed in another strike, if it was Israel that was behind this, they need to be held accountable. Absolutely. But we cannot already conclude that this was an Israeli airstrike that killed uh, these people. So I think we need to first of all wait and see what the investigation is going to come up with, the Israeli investigation, but also hopefully an, indep an independent investigation. And um, secondly, we also have to remember that Israel is working closely with this NGO. They are directly collaborating with them when getting aid into Gaza. So that already makes no sense that they would target them deliberately when they, the same day, was helping the organization bring in 400 tons of, of food to Gaza. Well, well, indeed, Yotam, but also it may have happened by accident. What we do know, though, is, of course, all of this fighting has been concentrated around the Al-Shifa hospital. Israel's military is now pulled out of the Al-Shifa hospital. This has been a two-week raid. Now, they are saying, uh, essentially, they've killed 200 terrorists, detained 900 more. Other news sources are giving different figures. They say they were in that hospital because it was full of Hamas and also Palestinian Islamic Jihad, the rebuttal, though, from Hamas has been quite strong. There is building international pressure here on Israel, isn't there, to essentially stop this fighting? One of the issues is that Hamas speaks with two tongues. When it speaks in English, it says that Israel is uh, committing atrocities and slaughtering civilians. When it speaks in Arabic to the Arabic news outlets, they say that they are heroically fighting uh, Israeli soldiers in Al-Shifa. They have confirmed twice that, that they are in Al-Shifa fighting the resistance or fighting the, sorry, the Zionist occupation, as they call it. So we have to remember, again, there's no doubt that Israel was in the hospital. Israel has confirmed that over and over. But Hamas has also confirmed that they're there. So it's a crucial detail, because if you just look at the hospital, and you conclude that after a military raid, the hospital is in ruins, any normal thinking person would, would say, this is a war crime. Why are you attacking the hospital? Well, they're attacking them because Hamas and Islamic Jihad are present in there. The fact that 200 people were killed and 500 were arrested tells you everything you need to know. Now, that being said, it doesn't change the catastrophe of those innocent people who are inside the hospital. It doesn't matter for them if it's Hamas or Israel that raids the hospital, but it's crucial for the world to understand that this is not a deliberate attack on a hospital like we've seen, for example, Russia doing in Syria. This is a completely different scenario, still tragic, but 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 very different. But I think, Yossam, that what the world sees is these images of the hospital being completely destroyed. And now the argument that if Israel was carrying out a precision attack on specific Hamas fighters within that hospital, the world perhaps doesn't see a need for huge areas of those hospitals to be completely razed to the ground. You're absolutely right. And this is exactly what Hamas's playbook is all about. Hamas wants the pictures to be as grim as possible, in particular when we're talking about hospitals, schools, mosques. So why does UN Israel facilities? play into Hamas's hands in that sense? Then, if you're saying it's Hamas because that wants these images to be play to be played out around the world, why does Israel play into their playbook? This is one of the internal criticisms inside Israel that Israel has a major issue when it comes to explaining what it is that they're doing. Israel has for years neglected its own PR um, communication to the world simply because it doesn't care. Israel is caring about killing terrorists, and then they think, well, we're justifying by saying that we're killing terrorists. We don't need to justify why Al-Shifa Hospital looks like this. And this is a massive flaw inside Israel, and it's something that it, it's common knowledge among Israelis that the, the government is failing miserably in presenting what it is that they're actually doing in uh, Gaza, while Hamas is a com in a completely different league when it comes to explaining the narrative and getting the world to see what's going on. I mean, it's, so even though it's, 
It's a really interesting point, Yotam, the, the, the sort of reaction on the, uh, from the international community there. When Hamas says decomposed bodies have been found inside and outside that complex, also saying that Israel is using bulldozers to exhume human bodies, we know the UN resolution says there needs to be a ceasefire in Gaza. So clearly the international community is moving in terms of the way it is uh, pressuring Israel. But we're also seeing changes within Israel itself, aren't we? Calls for Netanyahu himself to go. Absolutely. <clears throat> now, again, that's two, two different issues. Number one, Israelis would like to see Netanyahu go, period. That's what all polls keep saying. That's why we see thousands, tens of thousands of people on the streets uh, camping outside parliament. That goes without saying. But internally inside Israel, I, I'm yet to find anyone who says Israel should stop its war against Hamas and allow the rest of the Hamas battalions to be in place inside Gaza. So in other words, the, the frustration with the government is not so much going after Hamas. It's failing to get the, the hostages out. And of course, Netanyahu, who's a divisive figure, to put it mildly, who has three corruption cases behind him and who, re who refuses to take responsibility for, for failing to prevent the cement from happening. Mm. But yes, Absolutely, there is in, uh, internal criticism of the government. We see that every single day on the streets. And how much of this is a personal war for Netanyahu? Because this is a very precarious week this week, because this is the week where they may be pressurising Orthodox Jews into uh, fighting. That is full of danger for Netanyahu. Yeah, it is the biggest threat to him staying in power. The ultra Orthodox could pull the rock from beneath him because they made a deal with Netanyahu when they entered his government last year. They said, you need to finally uh, pass a law that exempts all ultra-Orthodox youth, youth from uh, army, from the army uh, forever. It has to be a solid law that forever uh, exempts them from military uh, draft. That failed. Netanyahu didn't deliver that. And they've stood by him for years. So they could be the ones who pulled the plug and say, listen, we're not going to be with you anymore. So this is a huge threat to Netanyahu. Um, it's a bigger threat, I would say, than the demonstrations, because the demonstrations, after all, will have to be so massive that they basically paralyze the economy for them to, to topple the government. But the, but the old Orthodox could pull the rug tomorrow if they wanted to. And this is a huge challenge for him right now. Well, thank you so much to Yotam Confino from Jewish News UK. Well, let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages now. Adding to our top story today, the Times leads on a report that a suspected Israeli strike has destroyed the Iranian consulate building in Syria's capital of Damascus. The mail features J.K. Rowling's challenge to Scotland's new hate crime law as the Prime Minister backs the author's right to free speech. And finally, The Sun reports on sports fans' fury over Team GB's redesign of the Union Jack branding it a union joke. Well, to Westminster now, and the government says that it is delivering on its childcare plan with the first parents in England now benefiting from 15 hours of taxpayer-funded care for two-year-olds. Well, Rishi Sunak says the scheme will help families and grow the economy, but Labour is predicting that parents will struggle to find places. Well, to discuss this, we're joined by, in studio by former a Home Office advisor Claire Pearsall as well as James Hansen of Times Radio. Very good morning to both of you. Good morning. Claire, can we, morning. can we start with you? Because in many ways, when you look at this, I think, I think it is a, a win for the government. I think it's good. They're rolling out childcare. Does it go far enough? I think it does. And I think we have to be really careful that you don't try and do too much too soon when you haven't got a guarantee of the places. Mm. If you speak to childcare providers, they're really concerned that they don't have the capacity to take in the funded places. So we need to ensure that we build out the capacity. And I think that we need to change our attitude towards staff working in early years sector, they're always seen as sort of just babysitters. When they're not, they are highly trained individuals. Absolutely. It's skilled work. It, it, it absolutely is. My child has been through nursery and yeah. I've seen it and they are absolutely fantastic and really set them up well for life. And we need to treat them a lot better. But I've, I've had meetings, well, <laughs> visits to various nurseries recently because even though my daughter's only three months old, I've been told, you know, you have to mm. already get on that waiting list yep. for the care mm. for two-year-olds. It doesn't seem like the, the plan has been costed properly and also healthcare providers childcare providers were warning Jeremy Hunt about this when he first announced it well this is the issue and labor are saying well hang on a minute you know it may be an ambitious proposal but are parents going to be missing out are there going to be enough places are there going to be enough staff because one of the issues is the pay 
yeah, of yeah. people working in the childcare sector. They're not paid very much. So, you know, recruitment and retention is a real issue. What's interesting, though, is that Labour are a bit vague on this. They're saying they're going to review the childcare proposal. Well, they say they won't commit to the plans the Conservatives have put forward, do, don't they? Yeah, well, well they, they say it's a, it's a bit complicated to kind of yeah. actually kind of drill down and work out what their position is. They say that they're not going to reverse any entitlement, so that implies they're not going to U-turn on this, and yet they're saying they're also going to do a review of this policy. So it's quite hard to work out what their offer to working parents is. Yeah, and let, let's just look at this, Claire, because actually, when you look at this, this is all about encouraging work, from what I can see, when you actually look at all the bans. So from now, working parents of two-year-old children get 15 hours of free childcare. From September, working parents of children aged between nine months and two years get 15 hours of free childcare. And working parents of children aged between nine months and five years in 2025 go up to 33 hours. This is the, the right direction of movement. It is if you believe that you want to get people back into the workplace. Doesn't and everyone? Ah, they don't. And when you speak to some part of the Conservative Party, they believe that the child should be with the mother and the mother should be allowed to be at home. And that's absolutely fine if that's going to be your choice. But for the majority of families, two parents need to be working or a single parent household absolutely have to be working. Otherwise, you can't afford to live. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that we need to be able to offer working parents that help to ensure that they can access the workplace because it is incredibly difficult if you have got a huge mortgage or rent and you've got all of those bills coming in. Childcare is enormous. It takes out such a big proportion of your salary every month that you need to be able to have a little bit of assistance. And if you want to grow the economy, which mm. is what the Prime Minister is banging on about constantly, you need to get people active into the workplace. Mm -hmm. And what constitutes a working parent? How many hours do you actually have to work? And also, well. <laughs> you know, which, which business is going to allow you to work for potentially just 15 hours yeah. a week. It's, it's one of those phrases you hear all the time from politicians, working families, working parents. You think working just people. mean families, just just parents, yeah. people, yeah. voters. But it's a really good point that Claire raises about you know, boosting the economy, because one of the issues we have is a lack of economic growth, and that's partly because of a lack of productivity, because you've got people, a lot of parents in their 30s, for example, mm. at a point when they should be at their most productive, contributing the most to the economy, and it's not worth their while going into the office, because frankly, they'd be better off just staying at home, having quality time with their kid. I mean, it's quite interesting what you say about Labour and where Labour's plans are, because obviously we have the local elections, we have to be slightly careful, we're in Perda for the local elections. This is very much the beginning of the general election campaign yeah. as well, isn't it? Oh, and, this and, is a massive and, issue. And in, yeah. some ways, in some ways, Rishi Sunak will be pleased that there's some positive news out there, because everything else seems to be pretty dire. Yeah, and, and the Conservatives are really keen to make this an issue. They see this as a dividing line between them and Labour, they think they have a genuine retail offer to voters here about, they would say, almost £7,000 a year of free childcare for some parents. You know, that does sound like a very attractive offer. Mm. So they're trying to sell this. Labour, though, have a fair point when they say, yes, OK, but it's about the delivery of it and are there mm. the places. Mm. Why are they so anti-working from home, though? Because for me, if someone's working from home and is using childcare, you're already maximising at least maybe two hours a week. That means that you don't have to travel back and forth to work. You can work a little bit longer. It just doesn't seem to add up for me for them to be, as a party, quite anti-work from home, yet pro-free childcare. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the, the joys of the Conservative Party is there are many <laughs> different wings and many different opinions sure. that apply. I think most people look at it and say it is the choice of the individual and yeah. it is the choice mm. of the employer. And any discussion between those two parties is absolutely fine. My employer does that. I work in the House of Commons. I am allowed to work from home. I can do that successfully. We've all, you know, we've all learned that lesson. So I don't think that the party as a whole is against it. I think what it really wants to do is grow the economy, and we have to be able to do mm. that. We have to have that economic growth. And if childcare is one of mm. those barriers to it, then we need to be able to solve it. And, and James, the economy is going to be very much up there in terms of the general election, isn't oh, it? Oh, hugely. And the Labour has published a report this morning. The cost of chaos, they're calling this. The cost of a Labour of a Conservative government chaos. They're, they're costing it eight billion pounds. Just briefly, what do you make of what they've published this morning? Well, it's interesting. I mean, they want to make this a cost of living economic election. Um, the Conservatives are keen to stress things, for example, like immigration and their plan to deal with 
uh, illegal immigration and small boats, etc. But Labour very keen to to reflect the fact that for a lot of voters, what they care about most is is the cost of things in the shops and the fact that they are still feeling the squeeze. So this just feeds in with with really what Labour want the election to be about. Yeah, and just reading some of the detail here, there's they costed forty million pounds for Rishi's VIP helicopter rides, one point four billion on scrap northern leg of HS two. It makes for quite difficult reading. Well, 33 million for chickening out from holding a general election on the 2nd of May. How much of this is politics, though? Mm, yeah, uh, pretty much all of it is politics, <laughs> because uh, chickening out of an election that you didn't plan anyway. I mean, Which this you is never just, called. Exactly. Yeah. So these are just figures that they've made up a little bit for fun, I think. But it proves their point that there's yeah. money to be saved. So that's really interesting, James. When you look at mm. that, uh, it is very odd how they've arrived at some of these figures. Of course, oh, yeah. they talk about immigration, they talk about R Rishi's helicopter rides and so on but but actually these I don't know how much kind of peer review there's been of these figures. No, that's probably that's probably fair. But you know, we're talking about it, and yeah. they're, they're, yes, it you works know, exactly. And, and they just want to make sure that the economy and the cost of living is front and centre in this campaign. So that's what they're driving at, really. Uh, and and what do you that. what do you think is going to be the number one issue coming into this? I think election? it will be the economy. I think it, I mean you know, different people will have different priorities. For some people, it will be the state of public services, schools and hospitals. For others, it will be immigration. But I think for most voters, it will be the cost of living. Right. Well, thank you so much to former Home Office advisor Claire Pearsall and Times Radio presenter James Hansen for joining us in the studio. Still to come on Talk Today, JK Rowling challenges Police Scotland to arrest her over the country's new hate laws and Grammy-style <laughs> shopping trolleys are back in fashion. I have one. Do you? Yeah, I do. I love I it. I don't. <laughs> the Mail on Sundays, Anna Mikhailova and author James Bloodworth take us through this morning's papers. That's next. Do stay with us. The time, 6.20. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <it's here. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're did fail her. Yeah, we're absolutely. supposed to have was moved on from that. Era. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth.
Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 6.23. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Well, JK Rowling has dared police to arrest her as Scotland's new hate crime laws come into force. We'll be discussing that in the papers next. Yeah, young people are displaying physical withdrawal symptoms from social media addictions. More on that just before seven. And then after seven, Shadow Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster, Pat McFadden, joins us to set out Labour's Cost of Chaos Bill. But first of all, let's have a look at the weather is not a bank holiday, so therefore it's going to be sunny, isn't it, Isabel? Uh, uh, you know, the good, there is going to be some, right? There will be some. Um, the good news is that I've been looking at the weekend coming up and that actually could be quite warm in Oof, Eastern parts. Wow, I don't want to promise too much, but it might be 20 <laughs> degrees. And I'm, like, slightly excited. <laughs> like Saturday. OK, so I'm just giving you that little tiny bit of information. But now to the story that's a bit more miserable. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. We've just had a really wet March and there's more wet weather to come as we head through this week. A really unsettled picture, low pressure systems coming up from the southwest, laden with moisture, quite gusty winds developing as the week goes on as well because these low pressure systems become more intense, particularly as we head through Thursday and into Friday, even Saturday, western areas seeing some strong winds and some rain, but more eastern parts, as I hinted at, look a bit better and even Sunday should see quite a bit of dry weather as well. Out there this morning, though, we're getting rid of heavy showers from the east. In the north, it's pretty chilly and wet, particularly central and eastern parts of Scotland. Some really awful weather there today, actually, where the temperatures are really suppressed. There's a wind coming in from the northeast, not pleasant for Aberdeen, even across through the central belt. It's a bit brighter elsewhere with some showers, showers for Northern Ireland. England and Wales are scattering of showers as well, but some decent dry weather, a little bit of brightness coming through as well. But we've got more rain gathering to the southwest, and I have to say that at the end of the day, looks pretty sodden really for many parts of southern England and South Wales. Not pleasant at all. Quite mild out there but the rain really takes over as the main story this evening through the rush hour particularly. Some heavy bursts and a gusty wind developing too and this wet weather will gradually push its way northwards as we head through tonight. So it's a wet night. It'll be pretty mild out there but rather blustery and this area of low pressure that's just spiralling to the south of Ireland helps drive this rain into more central areas as the night goes on. So it's a mild but wet picture for central and southern areas chilly in the north and then tomorrow well it just stays wet really for central areas and not a pretty picture at all it does turn a bit drier in the south through the day northern areas are still holding on to some quite cold air so particularly for scotland it'll be chilly bright for the northwest but cold sort of rain really for central and eastern scotland rain for northern ireland chilly eight degrees and wet for newcastle come further south well there will be some lively showers developing say for the pennine areas and the peaks but south of that i think we'll probably find a few brighter spells developing hopefully and it will feel quite mild when that sunshine breaks through Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Cheers, Isabel. Now it's time to go through the papers with the Mail on Sunday's Anna Mihailova and author James Bloodworth. Welcome both. Morning. Uh, Anna, Morning. you're going to kick us off with some news from the Popcons. They want another trust style leader. Yes, um, what they do. Mean? Well, <laughs> this is a very good question. So this is the popular Conservatives group founded by Mark Littlewood, um, who is an ally of Liz Truss. Uh, obviously was there from her time, her brief time in number 10 mm. and is now a thanks to her he he has said that he is basically trying his group is trying to shape the future of the party by finding the next conservative party leader which mm. is not controversial that's pretty much what everyone <laughs> currently in the conservative party is doing um this, this isn't specifically uh this is not people trying to oust rishi sunak this is very much people looking at the polls and saying right what comes next? Um, I think there were some really interesting things in the piece by, by, by Aubrey Allegretti. For example, that Liz Truss is apparently spending a lot of time courting candidates. So she's taking them out for drinks. Uh, fizz with Liz has been re mm. re resuscitated. I actually coined that. Just, just did, did you? I did. Oh, well, I did. That's in amazing. The mail well Sunday. done. Thank you. But this is someone, uh, <laughs> you know, Liz Truss is someone who's also courting the Americans, you know, talking... Well, he, she certainly didn't step in when someone referred to Tommy Robinson as a hero. Is this really the kind of 
blueprint that we want for the next leader of the Conservative Party. I'm going to bring this back onto track, but but just just in terms, of, well, it's a good question, but just in terms of the. Well, when they say trust style, that's what she's doing at the moment, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean trust style. They want someone who shared the economic outlook of Liz Truss, which. I mean, it would be, in my view, disastrous for the Conservatives to do that because, I mean, Liz Truss's, econo Liz Truss's economic uh, point of view is partly why the Conservatives are in the predicament well, so, they are so now. I, so, she crashed so the economy. Just, well, let people's me just throw that back. very high because of Liz Truss's but people, policy. I'll come to you on that. Because Unfunded people actually say that, that it was Liz Truss and it was her fault with the mini-budget. Mm -hmm. Many many voters, many Conservative voters, don't agree with that in the slightest. Mm -hmm. They saw a true Conservative and a true Conservative economic plan. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, just as Labour voters saw Jeremy Corbyn as a true uh, Labour politician and then they elected him and the, the wider public said, this isn't what we want. I mean, it's, it's after, after a party's been in power, I think there's a temptation to kind of retreat to an ideological kind of hinterland. We saw that with Labour, partly with Ed Miliband, then with Jeremy Corbyn. And I think the Tories are going through exactly the same thing now. I mean, look, I think what James says goes absolutely to the heart of the problem with Liz Truss and the problem for the Conservatives, because what they're saying is they want another free market libertarian. That is not a bad thing for, in a lot of ways. Um, uh, it, and Liz Truss... It wasn't her economic theory that got voted on. It was her delivery, absolutely appalling delivery. And she has done more damage to free market libertarianism than, than, but, than, but than was anyone. was it her or was it forces that conspired against her? I agree about the delivery. It was too much too fast. But actually, when you look at what she wanted to do, which was to reduce income tax, she wanted corporation tax to come down, many SMEs around the country would welcome absolutely. that. Absolutely. No, many people would welcome a lot of what she was doing but you don't get any credit for doing something good in a terrible way because she's just set them back. It's not about dark forces. Her, d her, her delivery was it. terrible, I exactly. Mean, the, the she didn't, didn't get people on side. Yeah, the, I mean, the, mar the, the money wasn't there. Like, Rishi Sunak himself warned about this when he went up against Liz Truss, and he was mocked for that, and he was actually right about that. There wasn't money to promise those tax cuts, and the markets didn't believe it could, could happen. It's interesting, isn't it? Could she have done better by briefing the markets then, as you suggest? No, because I, I don't think the country's in a financial position where it can afford those huge tax, cut tax cuts. In the same way that, you know, if Labour promised this huge public spending programme, the markets would probably react the same way. It's, it's just there isn't, we aren't in that financial position at the moment. Well, let's move on to our next story now, James. The front page of The Telegraph. Stealth raid on 1.6 million pensioners. Yeah, so, I mean, you've got... Um, Income tax thresholds have been frozen um, and it's dragged people into... It's something called fiscal drag. Mm -hmm. Dragged people into paying higher, higher income tax rates. These have been frozen since 2021. And many of these people who are having to pay income, higher income tax rates now are pensioners. Um, that in itself is, is going to be frustrating for a lot of people. But it also means that many pensioners are actually going to be doing, having to do self... Like, tax returns. Um, which one of the, if there is an advantage of being a pensioner, is that you don't have to do, have to do tax, tax returns, returns anymore. Um, and it, they also can be very confusing to have to do those, especially if you're an elderly person. They're confusing as a 35 year old. <laughs> yeah. Mind as a pensioner, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, um, I mean, so the recent budget, there was the, the national insurance cut, which is, uh, you know, that benefits working age people. But if you're a pensioner, you're, you're actually being uh, taxed more because you're dragged in, being dragged into a higher. Higher tax and band. Anna, again, it seems <clears throat> to me the Conservative Party is in such a tailspin. They haven't really worked out a lot of that older vote would vote for them. Yeah. Now, obviously, being dragged, as you say, rightly so, James, into by fiscal drag, if you if you are then make, you're penalising your own electorate, this is just another example of how disjointed the economic policy is from the Conservatives. Well, look, on pensioners, I I I would say that what the government would say, for example, um, is, is that they have given a lot to pensioners. So um, the, 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 the fact that the triple lock still exists has meant that pensioners have not been hammered by um, uh, the current uh, inflation uh, and, and all that. So in real terms, they are still very much well off and they've been protected. But yes, absolutely, it's completely correct to point out that the, the failure... It's not the failure, it's a very intentional Treasury policy of getting a lot of money into Treasury coffers. So let, let's call this what this is. This is a way of um, balancing the books, thinking, oh, this is clever, no one will notice it. No one notices income tax specials. <laughs> well, they do, and, and it's completely right for newspapers to point it out that mm. it's just sneakily, and it's a lot of money, sneakily it? taking money it, away I, I from believe people. it's £27 billion pounds this year. I mean, it's a heck of a lot it's of money huge. that they're It's making. huge, and it, what frustrates me is that 
when the when the chancellor comes out and talks about his great national insurance tax cut and hit tax cut here and tax cut there, all they're doing is tinkering. They're you know they're they're taking with one hand, they're <laughs> they're, they're they're giving a little bit away with the other. I mean that that's not good enough. Well, we're going to move on now to the front page of the Mail. This row again over J.K. Rowling. Uh, arrest me, she says. Uh, she's defiant. I think you should be arrested for that joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was, I thought it was quite good, actually. Thank you, yeah. David. Yeah. Of course, it's J.K. Rowling. Um, but she, yeah, she has been defiant in the face of Scottish hate crime laws. Yes, um, so there's a Scottish hate, hate crime law came in yesterday on April Fool's Day, and, and J.K. Rowling... Uh, use that to essentially double down on everything she is. She's becoming better known for as a campaigner she now is, yeah. than, than her um, writing in some circles. And she set it up all as a long post pretending to be an April Fool's first, um, saying here are some people who are women, <laughs> and then, oh no, they're not, they're all men. Um, they're all biological men. And if you try, and, and if under the new laws, um, I'm saying something wrong here, then come and arrest me, essentially. Uh, so that has been taken up. I mean, the pri Rishi Sunak has, has defended her on that. Um, obviously, as you can imagine, caused a huge amount of debate on, on Twitter. Yeah, mm. and understandably so, because on one hand, so these, these laws include threatening and abusive behaviour intended to stir up hatred. It's not just free speech laws. It's about that, um, that hatred, the threatening and abusive behaviour. And then she's gone on and tweeted about a load of pe a load of people saying, "Well, actually, these are men." Now, is that really necessary? Well, if you look at the example, I did read the thread but last night, and those examples are shocking. They are criminals. Um, Not all of them, no, because there's some just, of them. There's Monroe Bergdorf in there, who's an incredible trans Fine. campaigner, and it's really upsetting, I think, for people on the opposite side of J.K. Rowling's argument to go, hang on, you've just listed a load of people. The only thing that they have in common is the fact that they are trans, mm. and you're bunging them all in together, mm. um, and they're going to have this horrendous amount of abuse. And you've got, on one hand, mm. a rapist, and then on another yeah. hand... It starts off with rapists, paedophiles. I mean, it starts so off yeah. very, accuse them, very... You know, call them out for being rapists and paedophiles, yeah. not for being trans. The thing is, I, I do think that is, that, that is somewhat offensive, but at the same time, I don't think things should be criminalised because they're offensive. Like, yeah. I, I find some of these tweets obsessive and in bad taste, yeah. but I absolutely don't think the police should be involved. And I think the problem with the... the law it plays into her hands as well, right? Yeah, and the, pro the problem... Victim of, problem with yeah. the law, one of the problems with the law in Scotland now is you've got this extension of categories which applied to race before, stirring up racial, racial hatred. Mm -hmm. And I, th I do think some of those laws are necessary. But when it moves on to things like gender and religion, those issues are up for debate. Those issues, you know, we should be able to discuss those issues freely. I think that, that those are ideas. It's much more contentious, I think, to bring in laws on those issues than it is around racial hatred. And I think James, we should be able to discuss and James, gender and religi religion on, freedom. On that yeah. point, though, <clears throat> isn't there a real danger here? Even the police themselves say this is a troublesome law because many people are going to be dragged in because essentially you won't be able to say what you think. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's, isn't there a best, better use for the police's time at the moment? So we do have a big issue in, in Britain as a whole at the moment with... The police, for example, not investigating burglaries. You have cases of stalking, for example. You have women reporting stalkers. And then it isn't, the police are not following through on those issues. Mm -hmm. And so are they going to spend, be spending even more of their time monitoring what people are saying on Twitter? I just think this is absurd. And I think it is dangerous. I think going down this path of, of encroaching on free speech even more, I think it is dangerous for democracy. And it's like what defines threatening and abusive, abusive behaviour yeah, and who, I mean, who decides that? Um, yeah, sure. my issue with it, I'm, look, I'm very pro-trans rights. So I don't think there's any... Uh, no point in hiding that. I've been very outspoken in that in the past. But when it comes to this, I worry that laws that are so seemingly strict um, plays into her hands, doesn't it? It plays into the argument that, you know, I'm, I'm being silenced for my views, whereas, in fact, I think people just mostly just wanted to stop being nasty if she is being nasty and just put up... I think point. a lot of some people also see her as giving a voice to people who do not have a voice, which is yeah. well, women. <laughs> for, um, it's, it's part of the kind of democratic and it's that conversation. It's that conflation, though, isn't it, of, of criticising, you know, these criminals yeah. and then people who are just... And she, and she is clear in her post that, I mean, the crux of what I think she's trying to say is the people who will be hurt most by this are, once again, society's victims, so rape victims. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is what she's saying she is worried about. Obviously, how she delivers the message yeah. lots of people yeah. will be unhappy with, but I don't think you could criticise the actual 
crux of the argument. I see. Yeah, it's just the way she's gone about it. Uh, James, let's move on to a big story this morning. Apparently, oh. granny trolleys are back <laughs> in fashion. Now, I remember these uh, because I think my grandmother had one, actually. Oh. And, and you've got one. I love my trolley. So, so we're talking about those sort of canvas bags which are on wheels yeah. that you take to the supermarket. Just for those people who don't know what they're I don't have about. a car, you see. T so. Tell us the story, James. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, yeah, my gran used to have a, a tartan shopping trolley and uh, she took it everywhere. And it's... <laughs> uh, granny trolleys, uh, sales are up 78%, yeah. particularly among younger shoppers. And... Uh, it's partly because, I mean, convenience, because they're on wheels, they reduce the kind of load on your back and shoulders. Mm. Uh, it's quite easy to wheel around. Um, and that's the extent of the story. <laughs> <laughs> that's the full extent but of the But they're story. popular among Gen Z. Yeah, yeah, younger people, yeah. Um, I, I mean... I can I can kind of see why I haven't adopted one yet, but um, but I'm sure you can, it out. No, you can no, customize I... it with your football yeah, exactly. team or whatever Ooh. it is. Can you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could. Yeah, I'm going to go and buy mine now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much indeed to Anna and James. They'll be back in just under an hour. Now you've been getting in touch with all your views and your opinions. We were talking about this actually earlier on this morning about these figures from the Labour Party suggesting the government has wasted over 33 million pounds in not holding the general election on the same day as local elections. And they have said this is enough to pay the average annual salary of 100 nurses or 880 qualified teachers. So the question is, should they call the general election on the same day as the local elections? There is a fiscal argument for that. There is a fiscal argument. There's also just an exhaustion argument of the fact that we would, <laughs> I think, I think I speak for a lot of people when they say they'd rather just do it in one day than spread it across the course of a Democracy year. Democracy in action. Yes, I'm sure, over and over and over again. <laughs> uh, Mia says, they don't care about you, they care about your votes. Think carefully about who you're prepared to give your name to. Stephen says, if the Labour Party are going to complain about 33 million, why say nothing about billions elsewhere? Well, actually, they are saying quite a lot about the billions elsewhere this morning, uh, Stephen, but we'll tell you more about that later on. We certainly will. Just a couple more. Uh, Kenneth says, yes, give the Tories a double kicking at the local and the general elections. Wipe them off the political map. Grace says, uh, Labour is complaining as if the NHS managers would spend the money on frontline staff. If you give them three, 33 billion a day, the health service would still get mismanaged and waste even more money. Keep all of your messages and thoughts coming in, please. You can email us talk today at talk.tv. You can tweet us at talk TV. You can also text the word talk and your message to 8722. Yes, indeed. Well, now, according to the Shadow Justice Secretary, Labour has lost the trust of British Muslim voters over its handling of the Israel-Hamas conflict. Shabana Mahmood warned that it may be proved uh, difficult for the party to regain support from Islamic communities following a backlash to Sakir Starmer's stance on Gaza. Well, joining us now is Imam and broadcaster Ajmal Mazrur. Ajmal, good morning. Where do you think it all went good wrong morning. for Keir Starmer on this issue? Good morning. I hope you guys are well. Uh, forgive me if I'm sounding tired or <laughs> exhausted. I haven't slept yet because I'm fasting and oh, these yes, days we say spend most nights in the mosque, unfortunately. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be as, as, as good as I can. So <laughs> Keir Starmer's um, downfall, perhaps, with the Muslim community comes from the fact that he has taken the Muslim vote for granted. I don't know that you know, 80% of the Muslim population vote for the Labour Party. And in 2019 election, out of the constituencies of about 30, most of them voted for the Labour Party. So Labour Party has enjoyed Muslim support up and down the country. Keir Starmer, unfortunately, being a human rights lawyer, when he said in that fateful interview, and that is that uh, Israel has the right to defend itself even at the expense of violating human rights and international law, switching of electricity, water and food, I think he pressed the wrong button. That was the final straw that broke the camel's back. Up and down the country, wherever I go, and I often travel, I hear one very simple message. Muslim communities are going to vote with their feet and they're going to teach Labour Party a lesson for this treacherous betrayal that they've experienced and they're witnessing. And Labour Party has done very little to actually protest or do something substantive mm. to stop this genocide in Gaza. Now, you're, you're right in, in saying that 80% of the Muslim population tends to vote Labour. The latest polling suggests that of those 80%, 60% would continue to do so. So they've lost 40% of that vote over, the, over their stance. And Shabana Mahmood's warning is a strong one to Keir Starmer. Now, also, if you look back all that time ago, just in terms of, of the backlash that they had over that vote, remember all of those front, front benchers who were resigned or who were 
sacked as well. So, so again, Keir Starmer at the moment has to tread water to win this election. But it is things like this that are becoming to the fore that may well unseat him. Uh, I, I don't know that you saw 20 local councillors in um, Yorkshire or Lancashire resigned yesterday over Keir Starmer's leadership. And before then, we had seen it in Rochdale, we had seen it in Sheffield, in many local constituencies and local areas where the Labour Party was very strong and is still very strong. And you know, in Rochdale, though 35,000 Muslim voters live in the area, it was enough for George Galloway to win by simply getting 12,000 votes. So in some areas, small switch and small swing will lose, uh, or Labour Party will lose their seats, including Keir Starmer could be, uh, uh, you know, he could be in danger. He could lose his seat because I know Muslim community in St Pancras are organising themselves. So are they organising up and down the country. The message of it is very simple. We don't want to stand with anybody who has supported the genocide or has re refrained from calling for a ceasefire or actually just stayed silent. This is not acceptable. We as an international community have an obligation to stop any war from taking place, especially unjust and aggressive one, especially occupation. And Keir Starmer hasn't done any of that. And he has actually penalized MPs and councillors who have done something with their conscience. And all of those things are going to bite him pretty badly. And Ajmal, do you think it's problematic to focus solely on Muslim voters in this uh, argument? Because at the end of the day, you don't have to be Muslim in order to have an issue with what's going on in Gaza. Equally, you don't have to be Jewish to be upset about and want the release of the hostages. Why do you think there is such a focus on purely the Muslim vote, you know, Muslim marches, Muslim uh, peace protests, etc., when actually there's a lot of non-Muslim people who would support exactly the same argument? And I think you've made a fantastic point. I was going to say that to you all, the Gaza sentiment of Palestine, the support is ground swelling support. More than 750,000 people marched in London. And this is a very small number, actually, were Muslims, if you look at the the protesters and the participants. So you're absolutely right. People of faith, no faith, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, people of faith and no faith are coming together and saying, enough is enough. Stop this massacre. Mm. Stop this mayhem. So you're right. It can't, shouldn't be Muslim votes. But also, there is a substantial thing, and that is Muslim votes have been ignored, or Muslim interest and issues have been ignored by Labour Party, and we've already given up on the Conservatives. We don't even trust that they will do anything for Muslims. Well, thank you so much for joining us, as ever, Ajmal Masroor. Thank you so much. Well, still thank to come you. later on in the show, a senior psychotherapist has said, we experience physical withdrawal symptoms from social media, similar to that of drug addictions. We'll speak to two experts on the matter next. This is Talk Today. It is 6.46. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Hey. Quite hey. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! <laughs> it's carry on what just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans 
sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <you've got> to <laughs> 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back. Uh, the time is 6.49. Now, shocking data presented to Parliament has revealed that nearly 450,000 prescriptions for antidepressant drugs were issued to children last year alone. Meanwhile, psychotherapists are saying that young people are displaying withdrawal symptoms from social media, similar to that of drug addicts. So what have we done to our kids and how can we fix it? Well, joining us to discuss this in more detail are Marjorie Wallace from the mental health charity SANE. And we're also joined by Jamie Giles from the rehab organisation Castle Health. Marjorie, let's start with you, if we may. Thank you very much indeed for joining us this morning. I'm very worried about children's mental health. How worried are you? Well, at SANE, we've been worried for the last five to ten years because there seem to be an escalating number of um, children and young people who are self-harming, seriously self-harming, not just um, you know, crying for attention, but being uh, seriously self-harming. Um, they're also having suicidal thoughts and uh, they are uh, getting more and more eating disorders. I mean, in the last few years, the, the numbers uh, that have been diagnosed with this have risen by about sort of 30 to 40 percent higher in 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 the last two years. It's really alarming. We've created a generation of lost, uh, lonely, disconnected people, and uh, we don't have the services to help them, and we haven't done the research into mental illness amongst that age group. And Jamie, just to bring you in, you're director of outpatients at Castle Health. You've you've treated young people for for this kind of an addiction. But social media is such an umbrella term, isn't it? There can be some forms of social media, I expect, that are actually good for somebody's mental health. But as we've been discussing on the show this morning, so often social media can be quite toxic. Is it more about what kind of social media these children are addicted to, or, or is it just that umbrella term? Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point, and thank you for raising it, because I think there, there is that instinct to say, oh, social media bad, and we, we should bring down sort of draconian uh, regulations on on all aspects of it. I think social media can be an incredibly powerful force for good, as we've seen in so many areas of the world. You know, I'm thinking of the Arab Spring, for example. However, we're working with children who are not as responsible or or even um, biologically developed, physiologically developed as adults. They're not capable of making the same decisions or interpreting uh, fact from fiction in the same way that adults are. So we need to really try and work with social media providers to ensure that those um, environments are safe for children. I remember myself at the age of 12 when I first had my first online experience, it was um, presented to us as a kind of walled garden. And I think we've gone quite a long way since then. Mm. And, and Marjorie, just to bring you back in here, are we surprised that children's mental health has suffered when we locked them up in COVID? We made them put masks over their faces so they couldn't communicate. They were isolated. They were away from their friends. They were depressed. Are we surprised? I'm not terribly surprised, but actually that wasn't really anybody's fault as such, as you know. But what we, what we did create, we seem to have created a very safe and unthreatening world. I know quite a lot of um, people, but not just family, but friends and children. And it's particularly the age group that's particularly at risk are those sort of girls, young girls, 13 to 15, 18 years old. And what they say to me uh, is that they don't feel safe 
unless they have their smartphones on them, they literally feel too afraid to go out of their bedrooms in the morning or to walk down the street or to take a bus to, or to go to school unless they have their smartphones on them. And this reliance and dependence on the smartphone and on the 24-hour-7, hundreds of messages a day from people they don't really know but who are competitive with them when it comes to things like uh, self-harming and suicidal attempts. Quite a lot of them are going on to the dark uh, web. They're often ordering things like um, uh, sort of eyebrow pencils or something that have a sharp blade so that they can cut themselves. It's really quite a frightening world that they're in and the parents are even more desperate because when they go for help to the GP, they, but it takes a long time to see a psychiatrist. They go to help from the GP. And what is a GP going to do? He's going to offer talking therapies, which is the first line of treatment. Um, but there's a long wait list, a log jam, and it's up to 18 months that many people have to wait for this. And you can imagine that with a highly distressed teenager or yeah, a child who's yeah. highly distressed, it, up to 18 months. Or they can offer antidepressants. And as we've seen, this huge number of antidepressants under 25 is I think it's nearly 5 million a year or they send them away with nothing and that's almost the worst mm -hmm. and those are the people who call us because they said we've got no help nowhere to turn mm -hmm. and to reach the threshold to be referred for the help that they have to wait a long time for um, they have to be pretty on the edge they're not just troubled young teenagers well, Jamie, they are really ill mm, yes mm. absolutely well just bringing jamie in again according to experts young people are displaying physical withdrawal symptoms from social media similar to those of drug abusers we've only got about a minute left can you explain what those withdrawal symptoms would be yeah, absolutely. Just to give you an outline sketch of how this works. So the, the comparison that my esteemed colleague Tony Marini made was was that of uh, cocaine withdrawal. Now, now cocaine and social media work on the brain in the same way, in the way that uh, dopamine um, is is blocked um, by those by those by those uh, either behavioral or, or physiological inputs um so what you're seeing is is people who are presenting as restless irritable discontent presenting um, symptoms of anxiety um depression um a feeling of listlessness a, a feeling that you know emptiness and that almost life is not worth living um so it, it's extremely concerning and i would also say that at castle health we, we've been dealing with substance-based um uh, disorders, substance misuse disorders for, for many years now, alcohol, cocaine, heroin, just, and things like this. And Jamie, beginning sorry, to see the social to media. Sorry, Jamie, to, to cut you off there. We are running out of time, but thank you so much for all the work that you do. And thank you both for joining us this morning. Thanks, Marjorie Wallace from SANE and Jamie Giles from Castle Health there. Well, still to come, Labour are taking aim at Rishi Sunak and the Tories' economic incompetence, launching a cost of chaos bill and website covering the amount of money allegedly wasted by the government. We'll speak to the Shadow Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Pat McFadden, next. This is Talk Today. A very good morning to you. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Ooh, <we're missing. laughs> 
There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what, did fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Bourne and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is 7 o'clock on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. Yeah, we're talking today on TV, radio, online, and, of course, on your smart speaker. Your top story is this morning. A British citizen is among seven foreign aid workers killed in an Israeli airstrike on Gaza, while footage emerges revealing the destruction of one of Gaza's hospitals after a two-week operation. The cost of chaos, Labour attacks the government's spending record, claiming the Tories have wasted more than £8 billion. Pounds. But do their calculations add up? We'll speak to Pat McFadden this hour. And flag wars, fury over a so-called woke redesign to Team GB's union flag, ditching the red, white and blue in favour of a diverse design system. It's an unsettled and increasingly windy week. Today, cold and wet for eastern Scotland, elsewhere a few showers, but we're watching another area of rain coming into the south later. What's a diverse far. design system? Well, I, do you know, actually, I quite like that flag. I thought it was quite pretty. What do you think? Let Is it us the death know. of graphic design yeah, in no, favour of the, uh, the original flag? It's a nice but, interpretation. Well, do people know that the, the Union flag is also a redesign of the Scottish flag and the oh, Union... So uh, I did this at school, you flag. overlay them all and yeah. then you end up with the Union flag. I think that's rather beautiful. I think it's quite nice, but people apparently are very upset about it. So do get upset <laughs> via tweets, Yes, via let us email. know your thoughts, please. You text talk plus your message to 8722. But now it, it's time. Go on, then. For your headlines <laughs> with Emily Rose Adams. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. A British aid worker has been killed in what's reported to be an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. He's one of seven volunteers for the charity World Central Kitchen, who died in the attack. The others were Polish and Australian nationals. In a statement, the charity said this is a tragedy and that humanitarian aid workers should never be a target ever. Well, from Tel Aviv, journalist Yotam Kofino is told Talk Today, while it is a tragedy, it's too soon to blame the IDF. If it was Israel that was behind this, they need to be held accountable. Absolutely. But we cannot already conclude that this was an Israeli airstrike that killed uh, these people. So I think we need to, first of all, wait and see what the investigation is going to come up with. Meanwhile, Israel's military has pulled out of Al-Shifa hospital after a two-week raid that's left it in ruins. Gaza's officials say dozens of bodies have been found. Israel claims to have killed 200 terrorists and found weapons and intelligence. Donald Trump has posted a $175 million bond in New York to stop the state seizing his assets. The former U.S. president was given 10 days to make the payment in full if he loses an appeal in his civil fraud case. In February, he was found guilty of scheming to deceive banks and insurers by inflating his wealth. Rishi Sunak says the government's delivering on its childcare plan as the first parents in England benefit from 15 hours of taxpayer-funded care for two-year-olds. 
The policy which came into effect yesterday is the first phase of a plan to dramatically expand funded childcare for working parents. Well, the Prime Minister says the plan will build a brighter future for families and help to grow our economy. But Labour says that families will struggle to access places. And former Home Office adviser Claire Pearsall's told Talk Today nurseries now need to find ways to manage the extra places. I think we have to be really careful that you don't try and do too much too soon when you haven't got a guarantee of the places. Mm. If you speak to childcare providers, they're really concerned that they don't have the capacity to take in the funded places. So we need to ensure that we build out the capacity. And breakthrough technology will be offered to tens of thousands of people in England with type 1 diabetes. The so-called artificial pancreas uses a glucose sensor under the skin to calculate how much insulin is delivered from a pump automatically. The NHS will start contacting patients to offer the new system later this month. Those are the headlines. I'll have another update in an hour's time. Thanks, Emily. Well, now, in the last few minutes, Labour has unveiled a website called the Cost of Chaos Bill, where they highlight the cost to the taxpayer of what they're calling Tory chaos. Now, Shadow Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Pat McFadden, joins us now live from Westminster. Good morning, Pat. Now, is this information you've published only one step above point scoring? Uh, no, we've been very, uh, if you pardon the pun, small c conservative with what we've published this morning. We could have added lots of other costs that aren't there, um, but we've been quite cautious in the way that we've done this. And the point that we're making is that all these changes of prime minister, changes of chancellor, 60 ministerial resignations, all this faction fighting and changes of policy has, handed, has had a material cost to the country, to the taxpayer, to mortgage payers. Uh, it adds up to billions of pounds and it won't stop because they never stop. They're already manoeuvring around Rishi Sunak now. Uh, the leadership candidates are already plotting. And if the Tories were to win the next election, this kind of thing and this cost would all simply carry on. And Pat, can you just give us a brief breakdown of some of the top points that you're making with this Cost of Chaos website and what it includes? Well, for example, uh, the Liz Trust mini budget put rocket boosters under mortgage rates. Uh, that's costing families uh, an average of £240 a month. It's about £4 billion in total on mortgage costs. Cancelling HS2 cost over a billion pounds. Not having a general election in May when they should have had one costs £30 million because we could have. Uh, capitalised on the fact that the same returning officers are organising local elections on the 2nd of May. We have to double that uh, work now because they're going to have to do it later in the year. There are small items like severance payments to paid by the taxpayer to the 60-odd ministers who've resigned in various Tory faction fights. And there's another important point here. The cost is not just financial. It's a cost in time. Time is such a precious thing when you're in government. And every day that's spent on reshuffles or leadership challenges or plotting is a day not spent on working for the public on their priorities. So it's a financial cost, but it's also a massive distraction too when people want the government to be working for them, not plotting against one another all the time. So, Pat, will you yourself commit to a similar cost review if your party comes into power after the next general election? And will you also to commit to holding your next general election at the same time as local elections to save money? What I uh, will commit to is trying to get some stability back into politics. I think stability is hugely underpriced uh, and when I speak to international investors, they say that the, in, in, the instability in the UK makes them ask a question about whether they want to make the investment, whether they want to come to the country. Now, some people say that we're not as exciting as we should be. And what I'm saying is that maybe excitement is overpriced in politics <laughs> and maybe stability is underpriced. So. Uh, that in itself would be a good change for British government. So, Pat, speaking of instability, there's been quite a lot of it within the Labour Party over the past few months, hasn't there, with regards to its stance on Gaza. Uh, the reports of losing the, the Labour Party losing the Muslim vote 
uh, over Keir Starmer's stance on Gaza. Should the Labour Party be concerned about that? And I'm not just talking about the Muslim vote, but the vote of anybody who wants to see an end to the war in Gaza. Look, I understand why people have got strong feelings about this. After all, the human death toll has been enormous. And you were carrying a report a few minutes ago about a British aid worker who uh, has been killed in Gaza. So I understand why people have strong uh, feelings about this. And all the way through, we've said uh, three things have to happen. One is the return of the hostages who were seized on October the 7th, some of whom are still being held. Secondly, a stop to the fighting, which has killed uh, so many innocent uh, Palestinians, and a permanent stop, not just a, a temporary pause, a sustainable stop to this. And thirdly and crucially, rebuilding a better future for the Palestinians, because uh, it's, you know Palestinians were living in very difficult circumstances before uh, Hamas launched these attacks on October the 7th. And are now living in absolutely terrible circumstances. So we have to have a better future for the Palestinians. And those are the three things that have driven our approach since this but Pat, all began about six months ago. Pat, what would you say to people who have already turned their back on the Labour Party with regards to their stance on Gaza? What are you saying to those people in the run-up to the general election to say you actually can trust us in regards to humanitarian crises and accusations of genocide? Well, I think if uh, we were to uh, be elected uh, at the next election, uh, I know that Keir Starmer, if he was the Prime Minister, would be putting his weight, if the situation was as it is today, behind those three things. And they're all really important. The return of the hostages, a stop to the fighting, and a better future for the Palestinians. And that would be the priority for him and for the Labour Party if we were to be elected whenever that general election comes. And, Pat, if Israel are found to have broken humanitarian law, would Sir Keir Starmer, if he was leader, immediately cease the sale of all arms to Israel? Well, uh, we've always said throughout this that international humanitarian law must be observed. If the government has any uh, legal advice to suggest that's not the case, they should come out and say so. Uh, this is absolutely crucial. I mean, I understand why Israel and the Israeli people would be so angry after what happened on October the 7th, but any response to that uh, attack should be in line with international humanitarian law, and that's something that we've also said uh, throughout the past six months. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us this morning and giving us your time. Pat McFadden there, Shadow Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. Well, let's react to that now with James Hansen from Times Radio and also former Labour advisor Paul Richard, who joins us now. Let's start with you, James, if we can. These figures are very nebulous when you actually yes. dig into the detail. And I will take issue with Pat McFadden over a number of things. Chickening out of a general election. Well, there was never one called. It's no. in the Conservatives' gift. So that is a nonsensical statement. I mean, look, this is what political parties do. Sure. They're trying to do political point scoring. They're trying to find you know, lumps of cash, and they can say, look, the Conservatives are being wasteful. And part of the reason they're doing that is because historically the narrative is that Labour is wasteful with public spending, mm. and they're trying to say, look, the Tories are wasteful too, and we're the party of prudence. They're trying to be cautious. You look at what Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, has done over recent weeks. You hear Pat McFadden there say, actually, look, excitement is overpriced in politics. They're trying to make a virtue of being a bit dull because they think that is the way to communicate to voters they can be trusted. So stability, this is what this is all about, isn't yes, it? Yes, Keir Starmer is trying to say, look, I'm not Tony Blair, let's be honest, he's not as charismatic as certain other political leaders, but he's trying to make a virtue of the fact that he's a solid, sensible, reliable chap, or that's what he's trying to put across. Right. And, and let's just bring you in, Paul, if we can, just in terms of these costings also. He talks about the costs from uh, mortgages, £4 billion on extra annual mortgage costs. But remember, this is also about Ukraine. It's cost-push inflation. This is not just down to the government, is it? It's a brilliant bit of campaigning, though, isn't it? Here we are talking about it straight off the bat. And it's it's a, a way for Labour to make a broader point, which is that we have had this instability and this chaos, as they're describing it, over the last few months that, you know, I, I'm knocking on doors and people are saying, for heaven's sake, there's potholes everywhere, I can't get a dentist, uh, you know, the schools are overflowing, they can't get a day-long wait in the A&E. 
what's going on, they say. And the, the Tory plotting and scheming seems like they've taken their eye off the ball. So that's the point Labour's making. It's a campaigning tool. We're in a pre-election period. Um, and I think a lot of people will look at it this morning and go, well, OK, that's fair enough. Do they not leave themselves open, though, James, to similar criticism if and when potentially they do get into power? Oh, yes. I mean, yeah. this, this is a classic opposition tactic. And any opposition party would point this out and say, look, here are examples of public spending where you have been wasteful. But, you know, the, the Labour Party want to make the general election, when it comes, about the economy. They want it to be a cost of living election, so this feeds into that. I'd rather this kind of, you know, point scoring than seeing people dressed as chickens sent outside Westminster. You know, <laughs> it's just, it's a little bit classier, yeah. at least, isn't yeah. it? Well, but I mean, I, that's I just... always a classic one about, you know, oh, well, the government of the day is chickening out. <laughs> I mean, it happened back in 2010, the Conservatives accusing... Uh, the Labour government of chickening out of an election. It's a tried and tested technique. I just think that chicken outfit thing that happened a couple of weekends ago, it's just like, it takes the British public mm. for fools. Because it, I, I, I really don't think that, well, I think that people are very intelligent if they think they're going to be sworn by chicken outfits. I think there is a slight Westminster obsession with when the date of the next election is. It's, yeah. it's everyone's favourite sort of Westminster parlour game. When do you think it's going to be? Is it May? Is it June, July, October, November, whenever? To be honest, I think most people don't care. No. And, 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 Paul, that's the that's right, isn't it? Most people actually want to get on with it. They've got massive problems in their own lives, the cost of living crisis, for example. I think Labour has a number of problems, though, just going forward. First of all, I'm not entirely sure that anyone knows what Labour's policies are. Secondly, we've been talking this morning about the collapse in the Muslim vote for the Labour Party. Do you think that's a problem? Right. Well, I don't think there's such a thing as the Muslim vote. I think there are Muslims who live in Britain who vote in lots of different ways. And the, the councillors who resigned... 80% of Muslims vote Labour. The councillors who've resigned, I think many of them are under investigation for anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish hatred, and uh, some of them are not going to be reselected anyway. So that's no particular blow there. And I think, you know, anyone that's thinking about the next election is going to have to look at the international situation, but they're all going to have to, also going to have to look at the state of their local hospital and decide how to vote on the basis of domestic as well as international so, issues. So you don't, and mind, was... you don't mind 24 councillors disappearing from Labour? You don't think that's a warning shot? Not really. I think before an election like this, a big, you know, it's a big inflection point, the big choice is being made. You do get a little bit of a shakeout with people who aren't really, uh, you know, in the mood for being in government, making tough decisions, people who perhaps joined because they thought it was a party of protest. And they will shake out. And we've seen that. And people are joining as well, don't forget. It's people are coming in the other way. So it is a natural sort of pre-election uh, phenomenon. Um, but like I say, when we get in that polling station, I think people are going to say, what do I care more about, the state of Palestine or the state of the roads? And hopefully it's going to be about domestic issues. Really? You're comparing the state of what's going on in Palestine, the humanitarian crisis that children, women, hundreds of thousands of people face over there, to holes in the road? I'm saying that if you vote in a domestic election, you're, you're having a say over thing, how things are run in your community mm -hmm. in a way that you're not if you're voting just purely on international issues, whether it's Ukraine or whether it's what's going in Sudan or whether it's going on what's going on in Gaza. Uh, it, you know, people will focus their minds on their pay packet and on whether they can get a dentist or not. And those are the domestic issues that will crowd in come the general election, whenever it comes. So, and this point of this website today is that, you know, it is about a period of chaos now. People are, are sick and tired of it. We wanted an election. We wanted one in May. Um, well, no, and you I, I, want I, an election. You want it now. I, I, well, I think most people want to just, just get they? this out do, of the way. Do most people want yeah. it? Is that a statement? Is that a fact? Well, I, I believe that most people are sick and tired of all the chaos and they do want a, a settlement, a sort of, you know, a, a final result from the election instead of all of this um, toing and froing that we're going to have over the next few months. And uh, there's a sense that the government is sort of hanging on in there to its last gasp. Uh, without really having the nation's interests at heart, just sort of fighting amongst themselves, like Pat McFadden was saying this morning. So I just think, yeah, most people are fed up and they want something to change. I think that's reasonable, don't you? I mean, I, 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 I know it's good sport watching it, but I'm, I'm sick of it. I want to, I want to get on with it now. Let, James, let's ask James, yeah. sorry. Uh, Paul's right that obviously people do care about what's going on in their local area. However, something that will stop people from voting mm. is putting their voice to a political party if they believe that that political party are supporting causes globally that they morally cannot align with. So are we going to see potentially, unless the Labour Party, the Tory party and others come out strongly mm. in their stance on what's happening in the Middle East, 
and worldwide? Are we just going to see people not voting at all? You may see a bit of that. You know, there will be some voters who feel incredibly strongly about this and as a result will not vote for the Labour Party or the Conservatives because of their stance. We saw it in the Rochdale by-election. Yeah. The difference is there are not going to be 650 George Galloways standing all over the country. Sure. You know, he is a unique political figure. And when it comes to the general election, you know, Paul is right. People will be voting on domestic issues. So, so I agree with that. But he is galvanising that vote, isn't yeah. he? I think you underestimate Galloway at your peril. Agreed. Not you. Oh, I think they do. Sorry, no, not yeah, you. They do. But the point is about Galloway is he is an individual. Yes. And if you had 650 George Galloways with his charisma yeah. and his rhetorical skills, then and it may be more of a threat to the Labour Party. But there's no established party who are challenging Labour mm. over their position. But if, if Labour candidates defect to Galloway, that would be a problem. I mean, yes, it would be. Personally, I can't see that happening. I don't think there's any real prospect of, of Labour MPs defecting to George Galloway's Workers' Party, as it's called now. But you never know. A lot can you happen. You never know, James. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very things. strange world. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, James Hansen from Times Radio. Yeah. And former Labour advisor Paul Richards there. Let's take a look at some of this morning's front pages again. The Times leads on a report that a suspected Israeli strike has destroyed the Iranian consulate building in Syria's capital of Damascus. Moving on to the mail, it features J.K. Rowling's challenge to Scotland's uh, new hate crime law as the Prime Minister backs the author's right to free speech. And finally, The Sun reports on sports fans' fury over Team GB's redesign of the Union Jack, branding it a union joke. Let's move on now to the Middle East. A British aid worker is amongst seven people killed in what's being reported as an Israeli airstrike last night. Well, staff from World Central Kitchen died when their car was struck by a missile in Deir al-Balah. Well, Israel's military said that it is conducting a thorough review into the tragic incident. The charity has released this recent video of the Australian victim. We're at the Deir al-Balah kitchen um, and we've got the mise en place. Um, tell us a little bit about it, Chef Ali. This is the mise en place to make the, to cook the rice. Indeed, so uh, this is the, the beautiful fragrant aromatic rice that will be served today from Deir al-Balah kitchen. Thank you. Well, let's bring in Noga Tarnopolsky, who is an independent journalist who joins us live from Jerusalem this morning. And Noga, really shocking and very tragic news. Um, are we expecting all of the aid workers to be named this morning? We hope so, although that will come from the World Central Kitchen. They have said it's seven of their workers who are dead, um, foreigners and locals. So it's going to be a mix. Um, uh, the Australian who you know, tragically, we just saw the video of British citizen um, and a few others. Um, but that will depend on how the organization notifies the families. And it could be particularly uh, problematic for the Israeli government, couldn't it, Noga? Because uh, in order for charities such as this to enter Gaza, they have to have the green light from Israel themselves. And presumably Israel would know their location uh, once they have entered Gaza. So how can they possibly sort of explain what's happened here? I don't know, but it's not being denied, which is significant enough. There have been many accusations against Israel. You probably remember at the beginning of this war, the Al-Ahli hospital, an Anglican hospital that basically that had a terrible bomb and Israel was accused immediately. And Israel almost immediately at that time said, it's not us, we weren't operating there. So it's notable um, that that's not what has happened now. The Israeli army acknowledges that it was probably an Israeli strike that killed um, these aid workers and that it is in the middle of, a, of an investigation looking into it. It's just been a few hours. But the non-denial I take basically is an admission. And what we haven't heard yet is what they were doing there. So that we haven't heard the army say, for example, you know, we regret the error, but the bomb was aimed at X or we thought we were doing Y. So we just don't know yet what may have happened. And of course, Israel very keen to move the narrative on. Israel says its military has pulled out of Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City after a two week raid that has left most of the major medical complex in ruins. Now, they go further to kind of justify what they're doing, saying they've killed 200 terrorists, detained 900 more. They say they found weapons and intelligence throughout the hospital. They also go on to say, well, the reason we went in is because Hamas and also Palestinian Islamic Jihad are entrenched 
in there. But of course, the rebuttal from Hamas is that uh, decomposed bodies have been found, that Israel uh, is complicit in war crimes by using bulldozers to exhume bodies. There is no doubt, though, that international opinion is hardening against Israel. There is no doubt about that, that international opinion is hardening against Israel. There's also no doubt that uh, Hamas uses... Hamas is a terror group. It's a recognized known terror group. And they use hospitals, they use schools, they use private homes um, as, a, as their basis. In fact, when you listen to interviews with Hamas uh, commanders, Hamas representatives, they refer to the Shifa base. So that's not really a question. Yesterday, um, Israel withdrew two days ago from the Shifa hospital. It doesn't have anything to do with this tragedy involving the workers of the World Central Kitchen. And yesterday, there was a lengthy press conference by the Israeli army displaying a lot of this stuff um, that they found there. You know, it's one of these things where as the war grinds into now it's going to be it's seven months. It's, we're finishing six months of war this week. What happens is that the images are no longer shocking. So the Israeli army is trying to, I guess, make a point that it's fighting against terrorists, but showing international journalists for the fourth, fifth or eighth time um, weapons hidden in cribs, for example, or in... Um, birthing centers in a hospital doesn't have the same effect because we know what Hamas is. We know that Hamas is a murderous terror group. What we're trying to understand is what is Israel trying to achieve? And that is what is becoming more elusive. Absolutely. Well, no, um, not... Sorry. No, I was just going to move on now because for the first time over the weekend, the families of hostages have openly called for Netanyahu's resignation. What do you make of that? And what's the feeling on the ground in Israel? That is quite a big deal. Mm. The bulk of the families of hostages who still remain in Gaza, and let's think about it, these are Israeli civilians, by and large, who were stolen out of their homes by this terror group, and the Israeli government has not found any way to bring them home. Mm. From what we hear um, over here, these people are dying day by day. So the fact that the movement of the families of these hostages has moved away from just saying bring them home and is now saying Mr. Prime Minister you failed. That is a big deal because um, it puts them on the same plane as a larger protest movement which says that Netanyahu should call immediate new elections and that this government is no longer legitimate to rule Israel. But Netanyahu is doubling down. Now, we also know Israeli warplanes struck the Iranian consulate in Damascus yesterday. Now, that is very significant because essentially involving Iran here is doubling down, isn't it? And Netanyahu, very entrenched in his position here, of course, Iran is known to sponsor those terrorist groups such as Hamas, Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad as well. Yeah, I mean, it it does look like an escalation. It certainly is a hit. I, it may have been an opportunistic escalation, by the way. It may have been that Israel got intelligence informing it that this particular very senior general was in the consulate building in Damascus at this time and that they jumped at the opportunity. I'm not sure how planned this was, but either way, it is targeting a senior Iranian um, who has been uh, spearheading the attacks against Israel from Lebanon principally, but also from Syria. So it's an escalation from the Israeli side. It's an acknowledgement also of what you just said, that Iran is the nation that sponsors all of these groups that have been attacking Israel. And it may be Israel saying, we're not just going to restrain ourselves to the proxies, we're also go, going to go and try and get you know, the landlord of this whole operation. Um, Iran is promising a retaliation and we don't yet know what that may mean. Uh, Noga, really good to talk to you. Noga Tarnopolsky, they're a journalist in Jerusalem. Thank you, Noga. Well, still to come on Talk Today, doctors attempt to tackle the obesity crisis with 10 million of us hooked on junk food and grand theft auto security tags are being put on Werther's Originals no. and Slippers, apparently so, following a rise in shoplifting 
pensioners. My goodness. Well, the Mail on Sunday's Anna Mahailova and journalist and author James Bloodworth take us through this morning's papers. This is Talk Today. It's 7.27. Very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yay. Quite Yay. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know what's, I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> that, that oh, a, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, yeah. minutes, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. It is 7.31. We'll have the weather in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Scientists say seagulls are actually very intelligent and deserve our love and respect. Well, I love them. And we're discussing that in the papers next. Well, terrified locals say that Britain's Bigfoot could be roaming one of our national parks. Well, Talk Today's intrepid reporter, <laughs> Nicholas Ellaby, is on the hunt at 7.45. And should we legalise cannabis as the government faces growing calls for decriminalisation of the drug? We'll be discussing both sides of the debate. That's at 8.50. Looking forward to that. Well, first, Isabel... What's the weather looking like? Yeah, I think we'll just skip through the week because it's still unsettled <laughs> and just have that little thought about the weekend. Lovely. Yes, where it's windy. Let's do that. I know it's windy, but it will be quite warm, particularly yes. for eastern and southeastern areas. And I wouldn't be surprised if things stay as they are, that temperatures top 20 degrees, which would be a lovely change and something nice to look forward to. But let's take a look at today. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. After a wet March, we're starting April with more weather systems coming in from the southwest. Quite a mild direction, butting up against the cold air across the north with the chance of some snow for northern Scotland uh, the next day or two. But the rain is the story, and it'll be heavy at times, possibly some heavy showers with thunderstorms too, and it becomes increasingly windy as the week goes on. Friday and into the weekend looks windy with gales in places, but as I hinted at, some warmth 
in eastern parts. At least something to look forward to there. Well, out there this morning, some showers for eastern areas clearing away. Wet across the north. In fact, cold and wet for central and eastern Scotland with the winds coming in here from the east or northeast. Not particularly pleasant. And it does stay wet for a good chunk of central and eastern Scotland today. Persistent rain, as you can see, for the uh, Grampian area and across to Aberdeenshire. Elsewhere, it's a more showery picture, but I think at least some thinning of the cloud allowing a little bit of brightness to come through before we see rain heading in across the south. And it does look as though it will be a wet end to the day across many parts of southern England and South Wales. Quite warm though in any brightness, 14, 15, 16 degrees. But the wet weather pushing its way quite quickly northwards this evening. The brighter yellows here indicate the heavier rain and that'll push right up across England and Wales, even reaching Northern Ireland in the far south of Scotland by the end of the night. So it's a pretty wet picture, quite gusty across the south and west as well. In the north, we still got that rain, quite relentless, really, for eastern Scotland. To the far northwest, you might just find a few breaks in the cloud, allowing a little bit of frost. But for most, it's mild. And tomorrow, it's a wet one once again. The rain heaviest across more central areas. It does turn a little bit drier, maybe some warmer, brighter spells in the south. But really, for many central and northern areas tomorrow, it is a disappointing day. Midweek looks wet. Some heavier rain, some snow for the higher ground there of the Grampians and Cairngorm, for example. Northern Ireland, northern England seeing rain turning heavier with some thundery downpours through the afternoon. Not pleasant here, actually. Further south, hopefully a little more optimistic for the afternoon hours with a little bit of brightness breaking through and then it'll feel quite warm. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Thanks very much, Isabel. Look, it's going to feel quite warm. I like that. Uh, now it's time to have another look through the papers this morning with the Mail on Sunday's Anna Mikhailova and author James Bloodworth. Right. Uh, shall we go to you now, James? This is in the eye. MPs who lobbied to water down laws to protect renters' rights have received 450,000 in donations. This is Michael Gove, isn't it? This is the reforms from him. Yeah, so the renters' reform bill, I mean, it's it was Theresa May first announced uh, plans to end no-fault evictions, I think some five years ago now. Um, and this bill has been going through for some time and it's been watered down recently um, by mainly Conservative MPs and 18 of those, uh, according to the I. Um, either, are either landlords themselves or have received um, pretty large sums of money from either consulting firms they work for, um, for landlords, um, or some of the, a few of the links are a bit, bit more tenuous. Um, but, it, but there does seem to be a, a case of some of these MPs. You can't say they're acting on behalf of the, of the people who've, who've given them money, but it does... Like, who, who are they representing here? Are they representing their constituents or just those who, who give them uh, donations? Um, and the, and the bill, so the bill has been watered down. Um, In what way? So no fault evictions are only going to likely apply to new tenancies now. So if you've mm -hmm. been in the place for a long time, um, you could still be evicted through, through you, you haven't done anything wrong. Um, and there's also going to be um, something in the bill, which means when you sign up for a tenancy, you have to sign up for six months, and it's called the kind of tenant trap. So you could sign up for a place, find that nothing works, you know, none of the white goods work or something yeah. and then but you you're you're locked in for six months and this has been put into the bill um by these tory mps but but i'm i'm confused about this because i have been a landlord in the past and as a landlord it's not easy you have to also ensure that you're making a return or it's not worth doing and of course there are lots of people who don't own a, have a lot of properties but they might have one that they rely on so you need that six months security so i'm really torn on this bill anna well, um, I mean, I think you're correct in saying that while it's very fun bashing landlords over the part, including under the uh, success of conservative governments, landlords have actually been punished quite a lot through yeah. making it basically financially impossible and viable. Yeah. viable. So unless you're a professional with dozens and dozens and, or, or um, or you're a shark landlord, which of course this kind of legislation should be tackling, then most people are already getting squeezed. Um, I mean, look, you do have to absolutely protect renters, uh, particularly since now we are becoming a society that is much more rent, you know, it, it, people have to rent and, and they have to rent for longer um, and possibly have to rent their whole lives now. So, uh, and, and I, you know, I mean, I've written a lot about MPs' interests and I, I just think 
a long time ago, we should have made had tighter rules on donations, sure. on, yes. um, uh, on lobbying, Absolutely. and on uh, and on second jobs. Yep, yeah, couldn't yeah. agree more. Well, we're going to move on to the front page of the Express now, Anna. Um, Ten million junk food addicts are costing Britain billions. Yeah. Uh, um, so, so this is a story in the Express of doctors basically saying, look, the strategy of, of telling people don't eat junk food just hasn't worked. Um, uh, so what they what they want is to officially designate and recognize that food addiction is a real problem. So that food can be processed food, junk food can be as addictive as alcohol, drugs, um, mm -hmm. etc. So, and they're saying, you know, it, it's time. Um, once again, they're singing out the worst culprits, pizza, chocolate, crisps, biscuits, ice cream. Um, but, but the fact that this is a health emergency already and is going to get even worse is, is undeniable. And when we have a Mm. creaking health service, then of course something probably should be done. David, you're a doctor. Well, well I was going to say absolutely right. Yeah. And of course, when you've got 68% of adults who are overweight or obese, we have a major problem. And of course, that then causes heart disease, shortness of breath, varicose veins, diabetes, osteoarthritis, I could go on. <laughs> um, but we've also got a major, the obesity crisis, it, James, is also causing cancer. And this goes back to the very heart of it. And I've seen people who say, well, it doesn't matter if I'm fat. Well, it does actually, because we're paying for you to be treated. I don't know how you square that circle. I have no idea how you square that circle. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think obesity after smoking is the, you know, the, probably the worst thing you can do for your health. Thing is, I mean, maybe this is the right, the right approach. I also think that though it's, it's a more holistic thing where you know people aren't just overweight because foods, junk food is addictive. It's also because we're in a cost of living crisis. Well, is it because we're actually you can highly... cook? You can cook, but isn't the issue we're not teaching kids to cook? Partly, we're not teaching yeah. people about nutrition. I, I think partly it's that, but I also think you know people are working such long hours at the moment to make ends meet true. that you just do have less time to actually cook. I think both of those things can be true at the yeah, same time. Definitely, you know? and like with any addiction gambling, etc. there are certain rules, smoking, on how much you can advertise as something that somebody can be addicted to. And I really support the fact that we don't advertise cigarettes, there's restrictions on gambling, etc. but we don't really have it when it comes to junk food. Maybe there's, I think in some supermarkets you can't have chocolate at like eye level height for a child. But what about an adult? These, these packaging, these adverts are designed to get us addicted to these products. And I think it's about time that the large companies and brands took more responsibility and not just, you know, as you said, telling somebody who's overweight, stop being you, overweight, you it's have not going to work. There's an incongruency to it. You had the football on last week, England Games, and then in the adverts for the England Games, it's McDonald's, yeah. advertising McDonald's, McDonald's, But McDonald's, fast food. Uh, right of reply, would say there's nothing wrong with our food. We just expect you not to eat it every single day. Yeah. And yeah. they're right in that. Yeah, no, I, I agree. But we see it every day, don't we? Yeah, I mean, there, there just seems to be an incongruency between promoting, like, we need to get in, more into sport and stuff, but you can't, if you're doing that sport sporting lifestyle, you can't fuel yourself with McDonald's. There's an incongruency. We're not yeah. getting the full story. And, and, and uh, going into the next election, this will be about the health service. We know you can't see a doctor. We know it's falling apart around our ears. But at the same time, the NHS is picking up the pieces from the obesity epidemic. So, so, so they are intrinsically linked. Absolutely. Uh, all of it's linked. So... Um, there's a greater pressure on GPs from this. By GPs being overworked, there's a greater pressure on the ambulance services who then can't uh, address more, more um, critical calls. So I think there is absolutely space for smart regulation here. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. We do actually already have it. So they did quite successful. Um, they had a... Uh, remember those rules for fizzy drinks? Yeah. So, and I can't exactly remember how, but the, the policy of it was very clever in that it effectively had... Um, it encouraged all the fizzy drink providers to lower the sugar content without without forcing them, but creating regulation that actually incentivized them to do that. So now you can't actually buy fizzy drinks that are as, as, as sweet as they used to be and as are as in other countries. So they need similar in other processed foods. It's, totally it's agree. so complex, I, isn't it? I just find it bizarre that now they've got the, the calorie... Uh, number on <laughs> menus and stuff. And I go in and go, well, goodness, it says there you're supposed to have 2,000 calories a day and every single meal here do, goes I, above I and beyond it. I think it's incredibly it. churlish. So you go to a restaurant, it's the one place I can actually uh, relax and unwind, and there I am met with, <laughs> exactly. this is 3 billion calories, so I'm not going to eat. <laughs> it's so stressful, but then maybe that's on the, the restaurants to provide meals that are, you know, edible. Healthy. Yes, where do you want to go next? <laughs> Should we... Shall we talk about seagulls? Because every, about seagulls. everyone should show love to uh, seagulls. Uh, who's that, James? 
Yeah, so I mean, seagulls, I mean, I was someone who's brought up on the seaside, at the, uh, at the seaside and sea, uh, seagulls can be a bit of a menace, especially if you walk around with an ice cream. Uh, they can take the, the top right out of the chips. cone oh, or fish, yeah. fish and chips. But uh, they framed it here as boffins. But it's, it's basically University of Sussex. They've said that, you know, they've pointed out that there's an issue with seagulls at the moment. Populations are declining because of bird flu. Um, habitats, habitats being destroyed. We have to learn to live with them, which is kind of... Yeah, I mean, we obviously we do have to learn to live with them. I think they're also, when I went back to Somerset over the weekend, went to the seaside there, it's quite evocative to hear the seagulls. Oh, by the, yeah. it's, it's kind of, oh, I'm back by the seaside. It's lovely. Um, they're not all bad, you know. <laughs> but reports <laughs> last week of Liverpool being overrun with yeah. XL gullies, they've been dubbed. So, yeah, yeah, apparently seagulls are getting bigger and, yeah, Some more aggressive. aggressive. I love that headline about psycho chip knickers. It's true, isn't it? And actually, I don't know, did, did you find the seagulls are actually much fatter than they used to be? Yeah, I mean, because no, they're coming in land yes. and, and they're highly adaptable. So, I mean, they... they, they live out of rubbish tips some of them as well like they work they will not live in the sea anymore you have some of them come inland just live off rubbish tips just don't walk around with your chips uh, exactly. exposed well we can't blame seagulls for being lazy can we so it must be something in the food that we're uh, we're giving them there's a brilliant They're image addictive. of a, a seagull nicking what's he stealing there a greg's pasty or a packet of... a good choice <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it shows how addictive junk food is yeah exactly they're gone yeah, straight I mean, for I mean, it I mean it's interesting I lived in Brighton for a while and uh, the seagulls would come down they would take anything that you're anything. holding so so they're pretty ruthless yeah. <laughs> right thank you so much to Anna and James they will be back with more papers in just under an hour well let's move on now because Britain's very own Bigfoot may be roaming one of our national parks after local fishermen making late night visits have revealed a growling creature patrols the South Downs. What? I know. Well, what are we... they doing there late at night? <laughs> <laughs> so that growling creature. Uh, we're joined uh, by uh, our correspondent, Nick Ellaby, from the South Downs <laughs> National Park. Uh, good morning, growling creature. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> ah, good morning. Yeah, good morning, David. Good morning, Nicola. We're just here by a fishing lake, actually, in the South Downs, uh, not far from Petersfield, because there have been a couple of recent sightings uh, reported into paranormal and cryptid investigation groups about some kind of bipedal creature roaming around the South Downs. One by an angler called Mike Brown, who said he was at a fishing lake just like this one, well, I'm uh, just, just, just south of Petersfield here, when he felt he was being watched from the bushes. And then he then found some fish scales in a kind of pile by the, uh, by the lake. He said that was weird. If it was a mink or an otter, they'd usually eat the fish there. If it's poachers, they'd bucket the fish and take them away. He then, he then said as well, uh, some friends of his felt like when they were fishing late at night at a, at a place like this, heard a, a sort of two-legged creature rushing through the woodland behind them. And again, feeling like they were being watched. Couldn't see any torchlight or anything like that. And, and, and they, they actually reported this to an investigations group run by a, a woman called Deborah Hatswell who's been investigating paranormal and cryptid sightings in the UK and around the world since 1982. I got in touch with her uh, this weekend and, and I asked her, what does she make of these recent potential Bigfoot sightings here in the South Downs? Here's what she told me. We look in the area where it's happened, there are other British Bigfoot reports. So we may be dealing with the same creature, in my opinion. And I think that the shadowing the running footsteps, the stealing of the fish from the bank. We could say that an upright creature that was hungry saw an easy meal and decided to scare those fishermen on because maybe that's where it ate every night. So, you know, this, this isn't just the only Bigfoot sighting or potential Bigfoot sighting we've had in this area of the South Downs. Deborah's actually got an interactive map, which she reports all the sightings, she logs them, as long as she can't debunk them. I mean, there's been a place near here in Frensham in the 70s on the border with Surrey and Hampshire, where someone reported an ape man, and then again near Worthing in the 90s. It's not very common, but apparently spring is the right time for sightings like this. If you want to check out Deborah's page, it's Deborah Hatswell, BVR Investigations. I do have to say there's no scientific proof of an ape man running around the South Downs, but I'm going to spend my morning looking for one at least. And also we've seen over the weekend, people who run England's national parks, 10 of them, are worried about cuts to funding, which means that they'll have difficulty upkeeping and maintaining public paths. And look, these places are places of escape 
places of imagination and investigation for humans and animals to enjoy. So we've got to make sure we preserve these places for everyone, guys. Here, here. Well, thank you so much, Nick <laughs> Ellaby. Stay safe. What's that behind you? Well, still to come, Jake Robson is here with the sport. Yeah. Big night of wins for Leeds, Leicester and Ipswich are all fighting for promotion in the championship. I'll tell you exactly what happened. And there's more kick controversy as Team GB fans hit out after the Union Jack gets a bit of a makeover for the upcoming Olympics. Plus, I'll have all the latest on the launch of Man City boss Pep Guardiola's new Netflix documentary. This is Talk Today. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, did what fail her. Yeah, was to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. to talk today it is 7:51. now it was a night of big wins in the efl championship for leeds ipswich and leicester ipswich to tell us more sports broadcaster jake robson is here a very good morning to you jake you're so happy this morning i am actually because <laughs> it's a sports story i know something about which i'm always thrilled about let's start with uh, leeds though snatching the win for the premier yeah it was it was actually a bit of a crazy day in the in the championship yesterday because you've got the three teams who are first second and third they all played um, staggered times, so real drama. We, we, we started the day um, with, I want to say, Leicester. They played early against Norwich. They went a goal down. They managed to come back. They won. Then uh, Ipswich played in the early evening. Uh, real end-to-end -end game, crazy game that, that, that they played against Southampton, who incidentally are fourth. These, all these teams are separated by one point each. Wow. Ipswich 
uh, it went, they went a goal up, it went one all, they then went two one down, they came back to win three two in the 97th minute, at seven, you know, seven minutes Ooh. of injury time, so they really left it late. Fantastic drama. And then the last game of the day was Leeds. They ended up winning as well. So it's as you were basically at the top right. as it was at the start of the day. Ipswich are top. Hooray. 87 points. Leeds just a <laughs> point behind 86. And Leicester um, 85. Southampton are fourth. They're probably just about out of it. There's six games left for the top two teams. Separated by... So the top three are separated by what two points each. Uh, two points between them, sorry. What more could you want? Uh, that, I mean, I, I know I, I'm biased, but that, is it not a miraculous kind of transformation for Ipswich? Because they were doing terribly. Yeah, last season they were in the league below, the uh, mm. League One. And, you know, when you get promoted to the league above, the, the question is, can you stay in the championship? Indeed. Not, can you win the championship? <laughs> and the, the manager, Kieran McKenna, has done a fantastic job yeah. there. He's been much touted with perhaps jobs higher up the tape, higher up the pyramid, uh, somewhere further down the line. It's... it's, it's, it's I wouldn't say it's unheard of. It's very rare for a team to come up and then be challenging to win the league that season. How wonderful. Well, we're going to move on to another story now because Team GB flag change causes chaos, Jake. Can you tell us why? Chaos. Absolute chaos. chaos I know. Uh, <laughs> it hasn't gone down very well. We're going to see a picture of um, the, the new design. There it is. Or the, the, the flag, the, the way the flag has been designed. There it is. Of course, obviously everybody knows that the, the Union Jack doesn't really look... It, it, it's the pattern of the Union Jack, but obviously the colours have been changed. You know, people are getting very, very upset. Some people are getting very upset about the fact that we've lost the, the traditional look of the Union Jack flag. What people are forgetting, the people that are getting upset in 2012, actually. Indeed. Yeah, the Olympics. Yeah, the Olympics here in 2012, there, the, there was a play or a take on what we would think of the Union Jack. It was kind of a, they went for a blue kind of look about it. I don't think anybody cared then. I think perhaps the reasons for doing it then might have been different to... Perhaps to now. But to it's now. just a design but change, isn't it? It's not like they're changing the actual flag no, itself. I, I actually think that is a beautiful it's design, gorgeous. actually. And, and I, I don't have a problem with that whatsoever. Have we, do you think that actually politics has now intruded so much into sports since 2012? Yes, and I think it's the people that don't like that are the ones that are getting annoyed. Whereas in 2012, when it wasn't, it was just they decided to do something different. Whereas I think now there's a lot more reasoning behind it, and people who don't believe in those kind of values are the ones getting upset. Whereas I think before it just it just wasn't even the thing. And as you say, it looks really nice. It does look really nice. Let's move on to the German football kit because I saw this this morning, and I have to say I, I kind of gasped. Um, tell us about this because it's a ban on wearing the number 44 shirt. And when you tell people why, it all makes sense. It does. Uh, I mean, I had, a, had, to, had to have a look at the actual logo that is the problem, and, it, and it's connected to the... Apparently, it's connected to uh, the SS and Nazism, which obviously... Well, know, the inference is it looks like a swastika. There you go, exactly. So that's that's part of the issue. There's also the, 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 the logo that the SS used as well. I think it's similar to that. So the German Adidas have said no 44 on anyone's shirt. I think it's probably fair enough. But again, you know, some people... It's always going to divide opinion, this kind of thing. Very interesting. I never would have thought about it had I not been told. Wouldn't you? When, the minute I saw it, I thought, yeah, there, there but is... But they're not a... just banning that specific design, are they? It's, it's, it's all it's, number 44. It, it's that number 44 yeah. because of the way it looks. But also Adidas said that any resemblance, of course, uh, was not intentional. Yeah, of course. Well, fair enough. Yeah, yeah fair enough. Um, so, moving on to the next story now. We've got another Netflix documentary. I know. <laughs> and what a season or what a time to be able to, to have made one because Manchester City were being followed by the Netflix cameras last season. They didn't just win the Premier League. They won the FA Cup and they won the Champions League as well. They won the treble. Yep. So what a time for Netflix to be following them. Wonderful Fantastic. indeed. Well, thank you so much, Jake, for joining us this morning. Still to come, as the government faces increasing calls to legalise cannabis, we'll discuss and debate whether the drug should be decriminalised in the next hour. We certainly will. This is Talk Today. The time is 7.56. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat go. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. It's a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <is it? laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know it's I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did to, fail her. Yeah, we're we're supposed to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Bull and Nicola Thorpe. A very good morning to you. It is 8 o'clock on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. You're with Talk Today on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Here are your top stories this morning. A British citizen is amongst seven foreign aid workers killed in an airstrike on Gaza, whilst footage emerges revealing the destruction of one of the Strip's major hospitals. And should we legalise cannabis? There's growing calls for decriminalisation in the UK after Germany became the latest country to take the plunge. We'll be debating the issue this hour. And he really did get the scoop. As Prince Andrew's infamous Newsnight interview gets the Netflix treatment this week, we'll meet the photographer who took the real-life photographs on set. It's an unsettled and increasingly windy week. Today sees cold and wet weather for eastern Scotland. Elsewhere, a few showers, but watch out for some wet weather moving in across the south later. Cheers, Isabel. Well, now it's time for the headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. A British aid worker has been killed in what's reported to be an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. He's one of seven volunteers for the charity World Central Kitchen who died in the attack. The others were Polish and Australian nationals. Well, in a statement, the charity said this is a tragedy and that humanitarian aid workers should never be a target ever. Meanwhile, Israel's military is pulled out of Al-Shifa hospital after a two-week raid that's left it in ruins. Gaza's officials say dozens of bodies have been found. Israel claims to have killed and arrested hundreds of terrorists. Well, journalist Yotam Kofino has told Talk Today the raid was essential in the fight against Hamas. It doesn't change the catastrophe of those innocent people who are inside the hospital. It doesn't matter for them if it's Hamas or Israel that raids the hospital, but it's crucial for the world to understand that this is not a deliberate attack on a hospital like we've seen, for example, Russia doing in Syria. This is a completely different scenario. 
The Labour Party claims Conservative turmoil under Rishi Sunak has cost the taxpayer £8.2 billion and nearly a year in lost time. This morning, Labour's unveiled a website called The Cost of Chaos, which includes a bill calculating the cost of by-elections, ministerial reshuffles and policy U-turns, like scrapping the northern leg of HS2 during Rishi Sunak's time as Prime Minister. Well, Shadow Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Pat McFadden's told Talk today their calculations are cautious. It adds up to billions of pounds and it won't stop because they never stop. They're already manoeuvring around Rishi Sunak now. Uh, the leadership candidates are already plotting. And if the Tories were to win the next election, this kind of thing and this cost would all simply carry on. The Prime Minister has backed J.K. Rowling for misgendering transgender women in a social media post. The Harry Potter author dared police to arrest her as Scotland's new Hate Crime Act came into force, aiming to protect people from abusive behaviour on grounds of protected characteristics, including gender. Well, the Scottish Minister, Siobhan Brown, says J.K. Rowling could be investigated by police for what she's done. And Donald Trump's avoided having his assets seized after posting a one point, uh, sorry, £175 million pound bond in his civil fraud case. The former US president was at risk of having prime real estate like Trump Tower and his Mar-a-Lago estate taken away from him. In February, he was found guilty of scheming to deceive banks and insurers by inflating his wealth. You're up to date. I'll have more headlines in an hour. Cheers, Emily. Well, you've been getting in touch with all your views and opinions as always this morning. You can email talk today at talk.tv, you can tweet at talk.tv, and you can text talk plus your message to 8732. Figures were released by uh, the Labour Party suggesting that the government has wasted over £33 million by not holding the general election at the same time as the local elections this year. Would you have preferred elections on the same day? Yeah, it's a really interesting question, actually. Of course, it's in the government's gift to call the election when they want. And, they like. and it suits Labour, obviously, to say you need to have the general at the same time as the locals. But let us know your thoughts on that. Also, this is a really interesting question based on what Germany's just done. Do you think we should legal or decriminalise cannabis in this country. It's, it's an issue that divides people, I know that. Mm. But obviously we'll be talking about that a little later on uh, today. Also, we were talking a little earlier about children being prescribed antidepressants. The guidelines are very clear that actually you should only prescribe antidepressants in very severe cases in children. What do you think about that? Should kids ever be given antidepressants? Yes, do get in touch with all your thoughts and opinions as ever. Well, thank you so much to Emily for reading the news there. I don't know why I said that. It's because it's in the auto queue, David. <laughs> well, Do you know well, what? Put anything in that auto well, you're queue tired, and I you? will read no, it. No, but you're tired. I am tired. But indeed. you've got a little person. I do. I've yes. had about three hours sleep, so my <laughs> apologies. Well, we're going to move on now to the Middle East, where a British aid worker is among seven people who have been killed in what's been reported as an Israeli airstrike last night. Now, staff from World Central Kitchen died when their car was struck by a missile in Daya al-Bala. Well, Israel's military said it is conducting a thorough review into the tragic incident. The charity has recently uh, released this video of the Australian victim. Hey, this is Zomi and Chef Olivier. We're at the Jira Balaf kitchen um, and we've got the mise en place. Um, yeah. Tell us a little bit about it, Chef Ali. This is the mise en place to make the, to cook the rice. Indeed, so uh, this is the, the beautiful fragrant aromatic rice that will be served today from Jira Balaf kitchen. Thank you. Well, we can speak now to Gershon Baskin, who is a hostage negotiator and joins us live from Jerusalem this morning. Gershon, good morning. Uh, how serious mm. is this for Israel if they are found to be responsible? I think in any case, in any place in the world when aid workers are killed, it, it is very serious. The Israelis really need to conduct an investigation to find out how this was allowed to happen and certainly needs to take responsibility for it. I understand that this very important charitable organization has ceased its activities in Gaza, which is essential for helping to feed the people in Gaza who are lacking food and lacking ability to cook and to uh, get the nutrition that they need in order to continue living. So it's a very serious incident. It certainly is. Just in terms of uh, the latest developments there, Israel's military has pulled out of Al-Shifa hospital after a two-week raid. Uh, most of that medical complex is now in ruins. The IDF says, and this is the justification, it's killed 200 terrorists and detained 900 more. And it said it raided that hospital because it was harboring uh, Hamas and also Palestinian is Islamic Jihad there as well. Of course, the rebuttal from Hamas is quite significant. What does this do? You're a hostage negotiator. What does this do? 
do to those, those poor souls who are still being held hostage as the international community ramps up the rhetoric and indeed its actions on Israel? Right. Well, these negotiations that are going on between Israel, Israel and Hamas uh, through third-party mediators, Qatar and Egypt, are already very difficult. We have two parties to a negotiation that are essentially committed to killing each other. It's a very strange negotiation in terms of that. And the gaps are still quite wide. While 134 hostages remain in Gaza, it's believed that about half of them are no longer alive. And every day that they remain in Gaza, there's a risk to their lives. Hamas wants an end to the war. Israel is not willing to grant an end to the war with leaving Hamas in place and control of Gaza. So we're kind of at a deadlock, but there are negotiations that are ongoing. And as long as the parties are trying to reach an agreement, we should remain hopeful. There needs to be additional pressure on both sides to come to an agreement because this war really does need to end. The hostages need to be freed. People need allowed to be allowed to get back to their homes, even if they're destroyed. And uh, we need a new political plan that's going to put us on the path toward a two-state solution. And here I'll remind your listeners once again that it's time for the United Kingdom to recognize the state of Palestine. This is one of the ways to defeat Hamas without shooting a single gun, because this is not in the interest of Hamas. We need to defeat Hamas politically, not only militarily. Very interesting point there. Um well, for the first time over the weekend, families of hostages have called for the resignation of Netanyahu. Uh, are you in contact with any of the families at all, obviously in your role as a hostage negotiator? And what is the feeling amongst them? Because it's, it's quite significant, isn't it, for them to turn in this way? It is very significant, but the families are representative of the political spectrum of the state of Israel. And there are families that are right wing and families that are left wing and families that support Netanyahu and families that are against him. So it was quite a, unusual for a group of families, not all the families, to come out and call for new elections for removing Netanyahu from power. Um, I personally believed, and I told this to representatives of the families from the very beginning, that at the end of the day, they're going to face an Israeli government. And if they want to get their loved ones back, they're going to need to put pressure on the Israeli government. This is where an agreement can be reached or not be reached. They have no influence on Hamas, but they can have influence over the Israeli public and the Israeli politicians, and that's where pressure needs to be applied today from them. If any one of those politicians had a child or a spouse or a brother a hostage in Gaza, I'm sure that they would do everything possible to bring them back. Well, of course, the UN uh, Security Council passed that resolution calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, but Netanyahu is doubling down here. He has authorised military plans. He says he's authorised military plans to invade Rafah. There are 1.5, 1.8 million people stuck in a tiny piece of land there in Gaza, and these people's lives are in great danger. Right. Well, Netanyahu has said repeatedly that he's approved plans for attacking Rafa, and yet the attack hasn't yet begun. It seems that it might be also part of the tactic being used by Israel in these negotiations with Hamas to put pressure on Hamas to come to an agreement. The United States is definitely against Israel attacking Rafa without a plan to evacuate the citizens there. To evacuate 1.5 million citizens will take a considerable amount of time. So I don't believe that an attack, a full ground operation is impending at any time in the foreseeable future. And just, just in terms of where we are, I mean, in terms of the draft resolution, there was a deal on the table, wasn't there? The deal said that essentially the Palestinian Authority would be put back into control in Gaza. Essentially, they would work towards a two-state solution. That does not suit Netanyahu. Well, it doesn't only not suit Netanyahu. There's a difficulty in uh, the formation of the Palestinian government. There's a new Palestinian government that was appointed by President Abbas, uh, Dr. Mohammed Mustafa, who's a well-known uh, finance person, has been appointed as a government. He's made a government. But it seems very unlikely that this new Palestinian government will be accepted both in the West Bank and in Gaza. In fact, it was reported that two uh, security officials from the Palestinian Authority government in the West Bank were sent to Gaza to try and coordinate aid, and they were assassinated, believed to be assassinated by Hamas operatives. So you need to find a person who can lead a government in Palestine that would be acceptable and legitimate in the eyes of Palestinians before 
any kind of transference of power can be done from the Israeli army to that Palestinian government. This is what needs to happen, whether Netanyahu likes it or not. There is real no alternative to a Palestinian government taking over Gaza and enabling Israel to withdraw from Gaza. And Gershon, just your response really quickly to news just in that Israel's attack on Iran's consulate in Syria's capital, Damascus, yesterday will not go unanswered, according to Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi. He said that this morning. What's your response? Well, Israel is reporting that it wasn't a consular building that was attacked, but it was a headquarters of the Al-Quds resistance force who are one of Israel's biggest enemies. I don't know what the truth is here, but I'm sure that we can expect an Iranian response to those attacks. Well, thank you so much for your time there, hostage negotiator Gershon Baskin. Let's move on thank to you. Westminster now. And in the last hour, Labour has unveiled a website they've called the Cost of Chaos Bill, where they highlight the cost to the taxpayer of what they are calling Tory chaos. Well, earlier we spoke to the Shadow Duchy of Lancaster, Pat McFadden, who told us the government have wasted billions. The point that we're making is that all these changes of Prime Minister, what changes of Chancellor, 60 ministerial resignations, all this faction fighting and changes of policy has, handed, has had a material cost to the country, to the taxpayer, to mortgage payers. Uh, it adds up to billions of pounds and it won't stop because they never stop. Well, our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, and Conservative commentator, Benedict Spence, join us now. Welcome both. Alicia, are you convinced by Labour's numbers on this website? Well, I'd be really intrigued to know how they actually got the numbers, because <laughs> some of those numbers are really, really high. And sure, I just tried to go back on the website and look, but ironically, it's actually down and the website's crashed. Chaos. Oh, really? Is that <laughs> so is many people funny. looking? I, I presume so. I think it just launched <laughs> um hour and 15 minutes ago, so I yeah. imagine people are kind of catching on and trying to access it, and it just simply isn't, isn't coming up at the well, moment. So is it working blah. for you? Oh, oh, oh. Speaking well. of glitches, we're having a few glitches <laughs> in the studio. Uh, it's very early in the morning. Uh, Benedict, when you actually look at the detail here I have to say I agree with Alicia I looked at the figures and I thought I don't know how you come up with any of this mm. so one of the things they said 33 million quid chickening out of calling a general election well it was never on the cards and quite frankly it's up to them whether they do it or not yeah uh, they also talk about mortgages well it's cost push inflation the government has made it one of its priorities but the other thing that I thought was quite interesting about the immigration chaos they put at mm. 2.6 billion well the government has tried and Labour votes against everything the government puts forward so, in some ways, it's very <laughs> exciting in here. Uh, in in some ways, um, I agree with Alicia. The, these figures need to be looked at cautiously. Uh, the first thing you have to say, without meaning to sort of give you know any sort of support to the Conservative government, which is not doing a great job, is that all governments waste money. They waste an extraordinary amount of money on plans that fail, on administrative things. Uh, you know, one of the things that's cited it on this website, or at least it was cited on this website, uh, <laughs> is the cost of by-elections. Well, that, that's like saying, you know, <laughs> democracy is costing us money. That doesn't seem like a particularly bad thing, necessarily. I would have thought Labour would be really keen to have as many by-elections as possible. <laughs> and I think it's also also setting them up for a bit of a fall. I mean, it is very funny that the website has crashed an hour after going live. That doesn't suggest that actually they're necessarily particularly well prepared themselves. Yeah. Not to say that we're particularly well prepared for anything, though lights continue to flicker in here. Uh, but but, but, but you are setting yourself up for a real yeah. fall here. If you're saying things like immigration is costing X, Y, Z, yeah. this is costing X, Y, Z, but and then the Tories can turn around and go, all right, well, what's your plan? To be fair on the immigration point, that mm. 2.6 billion, I thought they'd calculated that from hotel costs, but they haven't. Mm. The Home Office had to ask for an emergency cash payment of 2.6 billion due to unforeseen expenditure on hotels for asylum seekers. So that's mm. just the unforeseen expenditure that they could have presumably accounted for. But what I'd say right there is that's a sign once again of a particular government department that everybody knows is not fit for purpose. Yes. Everybody knows is hemorrhaging money. Everybody knows need to reform, needing reform and taking up a lot of money. The problem is it's been one of the things that has been talked about at great lengths by the Conservatives. Oh, we're going to do civil service reform. We're yeah. going to you know, massively streamline the whole thing. They haven't succeeded in doing that. And there, there are various reasons as to why that is. But again, it, does the Labour Party actually, is that something it's leading on? Does it have a strategy on it? Because it's going to 
end up costing them a fortune as well, well running a government it, that doesn't properly it, it prepare. It is, and also, Alicia, we've got the illegal migration bill went through. You've got the safety of Rwanda bill still sitting in the wings. Uh, that still hasn't gone through. They're still on holiday. But also, just Rishi Sunak hoped that there would be some great headlines this morning about uh, child care, of course. And when you look at this, they're rolling out more benefits for working parents, and the onus here and emphasis is on working parents. I, I think, actually, I, it's very hard to disagree with what they've done. Well, this was an announcement made in 2023, and when it was first made, there were a few sceptics, but generally it was seen to be quite a good thing. The announcement was that 15 hours of free childcare would be extended to all parents of two-year-olds as well. At the moment, it already exists for three- and four-year-olds. It will extend to two-year-olds, and then over another period of time, it will then extend to all children under five. And obviously, in theory, that is a really, really positive idea. I mean, childcare in the UK is really expensive, yeah. Yeah. and it is one of the key reasons that lots of parents are finding themselves unable to go to work because it's not economically viable. The issue, though, is the supply. There are not enough nursery spaces as it is. There are not enough, um, do you know, what, do, what do you call nursery teachers, um, yeah, child yeah, child child yeah. Child yeah. childminders. There are not enough of these people to actually fill the demand that this, w that this will give. So that's the issue mm. today, and that's what lots of the headlines are saying about this, because today is the day where people were allowed to take that offer up. It's concerning, Sam. We don't even have a name for the profession. That's, that's, that's how bad the situation is. <laughs> yeah. I guess it would Do be we a used child... to call them nannies? Is child that child what they were child 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 I think child childminders. Child childminders. Yeah. Let's child go with that. Very good. Yeah. What about helicopter rides? £40 million from the Ministry of Defence on Rishi's helicopters. I don't have a problem actually with government ministers using helicopters using planes actually we're supposed to go. be no we're supposed <laughs> to be a first world country 40 we're supposed million, to though, after 14 helicopters months. are expensive uh, yeah, I know. helicopters <laughs> are really expensive well, listen, but doesn't it go to show yeah, yeah, I understand your point. We want to look sort of like, you know... Not even we want to look. We want James to be, Bond we, like we, No, the... not even we want to. We want to be efficient. We want to actually have well, a method of transport. Well, then why isn't the country transport. efficient? Benefit? Well, the rest why of the Why can't countries... we get on a train in time? How long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> How long do you have? How long are you prepared Just... to give me to discuss this topic? I, I, feel like, I feel like something... I feel like lots of people agree with you to the extent that it's not abnormal for the head of a country, the head of no. state, to use a private form of transport. But the issue is not everywhere. Yes, use it to go to like some really important summits. Use it to go places that are really important where you need to be on your own with added security and issues like yeah. that. But to pop, you know, from London to does he does he does, he does, yeah. does he use it to go and see the king for his weekly audience just well, across <laughs> Screen Park because he wants to avoid <laughs> because he wants to avoid Boris Johnson running in it. It depends maybe. where the king is. Yeah, uh, can I, I just ask so. you very quickly, Alicia, about Labour? Labour has a bit of a problem, uh, and certainly we've heard from Shamud uh, uh, Shabana Mahmood about saying that Labour is in trouble with the Muslim voters, they rely on the Muslim vote. 80% mm -hmm. of Muslims tend to vote Labour. That seems to be eking away because of Gaza. How big a problem is that for him? It's, it's a really, really big problem, and it's something that we've def definitely noticed get worse over the months and since the conflicts broke out. And the, the big issue, I think, that's really highlighting it is that lots of Muslim voters really just don't agree with Keir Starmer's stance on, on the conflict in Gaza. And lots of them, and we saw this very much in the Rochdale by-election where George Galloway won, and he very much fought that by-election on the issue, uh, on the conflict overseas. And it's not just Muslim voters, of course, it's anybody who feels particularly strongly about what's going on in Gaza. I think the, the thing is, as, as for as long as it looks like Labour is going to win a landslide, actually, there's a lot less pressure on people to vote Labour, voters like that to vote Labour, because they won't be worried about letting the Tories in, so you're more likely to see people go over to independent candidates who perhaps hold slightly more stringent views on Gaza. The problem with that, of course, is, on the flip side, long term, if that continues to be a trend, a lot of other people who perhaps feel a lot less uh, sympathetic towards Palestinians in Gaza might well then go to other parties, be it reform, be it the Tories, because they might say, and there is some justification in this, this is not actually an issue that affects the average British person. Why are members of parliament potentially being elected almost entirely on the basis of lobbying on behalf of the Palestinians? Which I think, again, that's a problem for Keir Starmer because I think a lot of people would take that view who are natural Labour voters as well mm -hmm. as perhaps natural Conservatives. Very yeah. interesting. Well, thanks to our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, <laughs> and Conservative commentator and helicopter rider, uh, Benedict. <laughs> and, uh, let's, very smart. <laughs> let's take a look. I saw it land this morning. Oh, did you? I know. Yeah. Yeah. Just, he just That's why time. nothing's working. It well, landed on the would, roof and it knocked you? the antenna. <laughs> well, thank you to both of you. Let's take another look yeah. at some of this morning's front pages now. Well, the Times leads on a report that a suspected Israeli strike has destroyed the Iranian consulate building in Syria's capital of Damascus. 
The Mail features J.K. Rowling's challenge to Scotland's new hate crime law as the Prime Minister backs the author's right to free speech. And finally, The Sun reports on sports fans' fury over Team GB's redesign of the Union Jack, branding it a union joke. Well, staying with politics now, and MPs face pressure to legalise cannabis after the announcement came yesterday that Germany was the third European Union member to legalise the drug for personal use after Malta and Luxembourg. Yeah, members of the public will be allowed to openly carry 25 grams of cannabis, hold 50 grams at home and cultivate a maximum of three plants. But should the UK follow in the same direction. It's a question that's been around for a very long time. And to, uh, with us in the studio to talk about this is Nick Pateras, who is a medical cannabis expert, and Ed Davis, who's policy director at the Centre for Social Justice. Good morning. morning to you both. Really good to see both of you. Should, should we just start with, with, with the pros and cons? Let's, why should we even consider using cannabis? cannabis? Because it, it does have some really good properties. It does. And I think that the, the starting point for this debate is really around acknowledging that the, the policy of prohibition has been a failure, um, that the market hasn't gone away. In fact, it's growing at an increasing rate um, since cannabis and all of the compounds were thrown into this sin bin 50 years ago. Um, and so we now have to acknowledge that youth access continues to rise, um, that regulation is really the responsible way for us to address the public safety and health issues around this, this topic. Interesting. And Ed, you would oppose that? Yes, very much so, yeah. I suppose, I mean, coming from the right back to basics, why do we prohibit cannabis now? It's because it's a harmful substance. Uh, it's because it's associated with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, psychosis, mental health. Well, very problems. strong skunk? cannabis. Yeah. It's skunk cannabis is. But lower doses, lower doses of cannabis, and I'm speaking as a medic, have really beneficial effects for certain medical conditions. So, and it's about, sorry, I was about to carry on there. It's not just these things. So, there, there are associations at all levels, particularly depression in young people and later suicidal effects. Yeah. Really good studies on that sort of thing. Yeah. That there is an association, however little. Uh, but then there's also the added thing. So at the moment, the other things that I work on in my work, working poverty, is children missing school. There's a huge link with cannabis and failure at school. I work on economic activity and some of the drivers of that, which look at mental health problems in young people. Again, is this the way that we solve mental health problems? Young but we people? wouldn't be legalising it for young children. It, <clears throat> it would we'd, be for we'd be adults. Doing it for young people, we would see an increase in that sort of 18 to 24 bracket. And certainly this idea that prohibition hasn't worked. Every single survey ever done of people saying, would you use it if it was legalised, suggests that they would. And there are lots of countries where it has been legalised that has seen increases, particularly in young people. But isn't there a difference between, yes, somebody saying, yes, we would, I would use it perhaps recreationally, once in a blue moon on a special occasion, and somebody who would become addicted to it? Yes. I mean, uh, first, we have to acknowledge that cannabis is not an entirely benign substance. Yeah. There is a risk for a small group of, of consumers that it can be habit-forming. But it's a low risk and it's for a small group. Um, and I would contend that actually when you regulate, uh, the studies demonstrate that youth access actually goes down. We've seen that across the US states that have legalized uh, adult use access, as well as Canada. Uh, high school students find it harder to access cannabis after legalization, and their consumption rates actually decrease because it becomes harder. Can we just go back to the idea about prohibition? And you said something quite intriguing. The reason we do this is because it's dangerous. The reason we do it is because the, the politics dictate we do it. When you look at the drug classification, those classes are ridiculous. The cannabis is in class B. There are certain drugs that shouldn't be in classes. David Nutt, who was the professor at the time, said this classification is wrong. It needs to change. And what did they do? He was the head of the advisory, the, the uh, a committee on advisory for the misuse of drugs. Mm. What did they do? They fired him. They did. I, I mean, the classification of drugs is a slightly different question. We can get into the weeds over the different classifications for the different <laughs> so kinds of drugs, and, so to speak, <laughs> uh, and, and, and the way you do that. But I think the reason that, that you're right that it is political is actually politicians, to be fair to them, they see this in their constituencies, in constituencies. And particularly if you go into deprived areas and go onto the tough housing estates and you see what is going on, you don't see lives that are full of hope you see that this is actually driving a lot of problems. But is it cannabis that we're seeing in those deprived communities yeah. or is it harder drugs? Because in my experience, it tends, yes, cannabis, certainly, but other drugs too. Cannabis is certainly the most widely used, yes. No. And, well, I would, I would actually say that the, the picture that Ed's painting is actually an argument for regulation. The picture that Ed's painting is a result of the current system of prohibition. We have a, a system whereby there is a market. It's not for us to determine whether or not cannabis will be available in this country, because it is. And so it's actually government's responsibility 
to protect people from substances that can be harmful, but actually for many people are used responsibly. And I think it's the, the moral, ethical choice to keep the market that's already established out of the hands of criminal enterprise. And are we talking here about decriminalization or legalization? I understand there's sometimes a, a difference in the way that those two things are defined, because we don't want to see, I think, well, I think many people would think that prisons being full of people who are dealing weed or smoking weed or have possession of cannabis, it's just not the right use of our prison spaces. And in, if we were to decriminalise it, that wouldn't happen, Ed. Well, at the moment, I mean, our prisons are in a complete mess on drugs. Yeah. You have some yeah. prisons that, uh, where people are going in clean and coming out with a serious yes. drug addiction. And that comes back to when you make drugs available, they are addictive. About one in 10 people that take cannabis will develop an addiction. And that is a, that's a high number. But is it you... right that people are having criminal records for simply possessing a drug like this? Well, yes, because it's illegal. So, well, it's... But, have, but, 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 that, that, that's, but that ruins their, you know... In many ways, that's chicken and egg. But let's yeah. just go back to your point, Nick. How would you address that? So, well, I think your point is that if you tightly control the market, you regulate it, first of all, people who take it know what they're taking. Mm. They know the strength of what they're taking. We can also re raise revenue on the back of that to pay for things like the health service or, indeed, drug misuse centres. Isn't there an argument to say... Prohibition has failed, and we need to have a grown-up conversation about how we move this forward. So there is nowhere in the world that has managed to wipe out the illicit market. Sometimes they've halved it, will. sometimes it's two-thirds. But the idea that by regulating it, we get rid of the illicit market is, has been proven false. But also, I mean, we did a round table with half a dozen drug dealers and said to them, if we legalise cannabis, will this put you out of a role? And they laughed at us, because what they do is they come with a, a whole range different of drugs. Strains. Different yeah. things, different yeah. strains. And, and so people will not just go to the, the, the regulated market. What you will find is wealthy people who want to feel good about themselves will go to the regulated market. And the kids on the estate, the people who can't afford the regulated, highly taxed market, all that, they will keep taking what they were taking from unregulated illicit. Do, do you think, Nick, finally, if we can just ask you, do you think this argument is moving on? It feels to me that every country is moving in this direction. Are we likely to move in that direction, do you think? I think eventually it's inevitable. I think it'll take some time because I think certain countries need to play the guinea pigs. But when you look at countries like Canada or states across the US, uh, markets in which I've worked, the data is very clear. These policies take time to settle in, but they are successful. Certainly a very fascinating debate, yeah. and one we'll continue to have, I'm sure. Feisty as yes, well. Very feisty. <laughs> Thank you very so feisty. much to canna cannabis industry consultant Nick Pateras and Ed Davis from the Centre for Social Justice. Thank you both. We'll still to come on talk today. The number of patients waiting more than a month to see a GP has soared, and the National Trust are forced to defend their scone recipe. It's scone, not scone, as they're accused of going woke. It's definitely it scone. It is. Yeah, I know. The Mail on Sunday is uh, Anna Mikova and author James Bloodworth. Take us through the papers. That's next. Do stay with us. The time is 8.29. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman is not a woman. Trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <listen. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth blimp. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested 
Alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, we're supposed to have moved on from that. Era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.32. We'll have the weather for you in just a moment, but here's what else is coming up in the programme. Well, figures show police failed to arrest a single car thief in over 100 neighbourhoods last year. We'll be discussing that in the papers next. As Netflix gear up to release drama Scoop, we're going to be talking to a royal photographer who was there in the room when Prince Andrew's infamous Newsnight interview happened, and that is coming up just before nine. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> and the popular Conservative group has launched a plan to install a Liz Truss-style candidate as the next Tory leader. We'll have more info on that just after nine. But first of all, the really exciting moment. Isabel's here with all the weather. <laughs> yeah, and it's only exciting because we're a bit excited about Saturday. I'm we very excited. We have to excited. go that far on to yeah. actually find some decent weather. <laughs> It's not what far. A no, it's just <laughs> months and months of rain. Let's take a look at today's forecast, though. But at least the weekend is looking better for eastern areas, where it could well top 20 degrees. <laughs> Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Until the weekend, though, and in fact, including the weekend, still really unsettled with low pressure systems piling in from the southwest, often uh, rather gusty as well in and around some of the heavier showers. Not a pretty picture. In fact, a slow moving low, bringing some really wet weather to the central and northern areas tomorrow. More heavy showers Thursday. And then this rather large depression swinging in for Friday, bringing strengthening winds and rain. And Saturday's rain looks as though it'll be mostly to the west. Windy for many, but eastern areas getting away with that drier, warmer weather. Now, out there today, well, hopefully some thinning of the cloud across many central and southern areas allowing some sunshine, but there will be some showers, especially across northern England. But up into Scotland, that's where the most persistent wet weather will be. Central and eastern areas chilly and wet, with the winds coming in from the northeast. A bit brighter for Northern Ireland with showers. Cumbria and northern England seeing some showers, a little bit of brightness too. And further south, hopefully some warmer, sunnier spells. But watch out for the next batch of rain that will be heading in from the southwest through the latter part of the afternoon, giving a wet evening rush hour. Quite warm for some in the south, 15 to 17 degrees. But horrible if you're travelling this evening across the south. That wet weather will push in quite quickly this evening across southern England, Wales, into the Midlands and East Anglia. And actually by the end of the night, pushing right up towards the borders and Northern Ireland. So it'll be wet for many tonight and mild for central and southern areas, but it uh, does look as though the far northwest of Scotland will keep in that cold air. So here, a little bit of wintriness over the Cairngorms, for example, and maybe a touch of frost in northwest Scotland. But you can just see the sort of dismal picture for Wednesday. Wet, particularly central and eastern areas on Wednesday. To the south, it does turn a bit drier through the day, a little bit of brightness. But to the north, Maybe some sunshine for the Western Isles, the Northwest Highlands. Otherwise, there's rain for Scotland and chilly winds and actually some snow for the higher ground there. Wet for Northern Ireland, Northern England. The rain gives way to heavy downpours, possibly thundery. Maybe East Anglia in the south getting away with some sunshine tomorrow afternoon where it'll feel quite mild out and about with temperatures around about the 15 or 16 Celsius mark. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Well, thank you, Isabel. It's time to go through the papers again with the Mail on Sunday's Anna Mihailova and author 
James Bloodworth. But before we do, um, there's just been a report in that several people have been injured in a school shooting in Finland, uh, sadly. So we will be keeping you up to date with the latest on that as and when we get it. Um, but we're going to move on now. Anna, the top story uh, we're going to be talking about in the mail. It's a Mail Online article. So this is um, a story about the scale of mental health, um, the mental health crisis among the young. And um, it says that nearly half a million antidepressant prescriptions are being given to children each year. So there's, uh, there's been a, both a spike in the prescriptions um, and also obviously warnings about a generation of lost and lonely young people is what experts are saying. Um, now, this is a absolutely enormous problem, multifaceted, so it's quite hard to pin it down into one thing, but you know, there are a couple of things being highlighted. One is, because of the crisis in the health service, there, are just, there isn't the capacity to treat the number of young people and children who need help. Um, and therefore, some in those crisis situations are getting just antidepressants prescribed. So there's a scary statistic that a quarter of kids who um, were surveyed who'd been given antidepressants didn't even see a child psychiatrist before no. getting that. Which is totally against the, Which is the guidelines. But the issue, as you rightly point out, is, of course, if you can't see the child psychiatrist, then what do you do as the yeah. GP? Well, exactly. And you can't completely blame GPs here because there are, these are children who could you know, go on, who could be a suicide risk. Um, so you have to give them something. You have to help them. And it, and it's 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 a I mean it's it's hard to sort of say what to even know what to say because there's there's the element of the health service that needs um, kicking into gear over this, but there's also the fact that that this generation of children through social media through COVID it has just been basically subject to a giant social experiment that we're only now seeing the consequences 100% of. Hundred percent right. We locked children up. We didn't allow them to mingle. We actually made them cover their faces. All the things that we did that I think we will look back on uh, and, and realise what we did was absolutely abhorrent. Talking about awful medical news, should we move to the Daily Mirror, James? Uh, this, this big headline this morning, Doctor won't see you now. Yeah, so it's been become, as most of us, I suppose, know now, it's become much harder to get a doctor's appointment. And it's also, there's something that stood out for me here, which has been kind of uh, agreements of mine and, and friends of mine in recent years is when you phone up to get a doctor's appointment, you often can get seen, but it's, it's, it's less and less with a doctor. So it says here that only four in 10 appointments in general practice are now with a doctor. So you tend to, it feels like sometimes get palmed off to see a nurse or then you speak to someone who isn't qualified to actually Well, uh, I, I'm going to defend nurses or... now. Um, yeah, because, I mean, because obviously not everyone needs to be seen by a doctor. But I think so... sometimes you do and sometimes mm -hmm. it feels like you're just pushed so over to someone choice. else. Yeah, I think, I think definitely there's things like pharmacy as well. Pharmacy can definitely do more. There are things that people can go to community pharmacists for. You don't need to see a doctor, especially if there's, there are the worried well. You know, you don't need to see a GP sometimes. But I think also it, the, the service is under such strain now that when people do need to see a doctor or do need to see a specialist, they're, they're just kind of palmed off onto, onto someone else. I certainly have a frustration. I was just talking to you about my most recent contact with my GP because I had to get wait two weeks for a phone appointment mm. and then another two weeks to see a nurse who was then only to tell me that I have to see a GP anyway. Yeah. And it's only to get referred to a specialist at a hospital. So it's four appointments that could really have been one. I mean, yeah. Anna, there's a much bigger problem brewing here and, and West Streeting, I think, has tried to tackle this as he, if they come into power. But actually, when you look at the data, there are only 27,000 GPs left in this country. We're going to lose 8,800 of them. Problem, yeah. uh, we've also lost 1,200 practices. They've closed. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the population has gone up by 10 million. Now, you do the maths on that, it's going to be impossible. And it's got older. Sorry, and, we, and, and we've yes. got older. Yes, yeah, so you've got an elderly population with yeah. more chronic needs. How do you think, just going into the next election, Labour, Labour is saying we're going to sort out the NHS. Mm. Good luck. Well, quite, um, and good luck on, on many fronts, I think, as well. So we're sorting yeah, quite a exactly. lot of things out. Um, I mean, look, every, everything you say, completely right. Um, I think there are different ways. I mean, there, are, there, are, there, are, there is flexibility that can be put into the system. Like Nicola, you say, you know, some, some, sometimes it's just box ticking. Sometimes mm. it's just process that doesn't need to be there. Um, 
well, speaking personally, my my very good uh, react. Uh, I, I had a very good interaction recently with my local GP, partly because I wanted to see the GP. I wasn't allowed to, but then I got a phone call from the pharmacist in the GP, who was unbelievably helpful, probably Brilliant. more helpful than than any appointment yeah. could have been. So those sort of flexibilities can really help. Um, but. Yeah, otherwise it, it pretty much is a ticking time bomb. Well, let's move on now to a story in the mirror. Almost 400 towns have been told that their last remaining local bank is closing down. Yeah, there's a cash machine desert, so you have more and more places in the country that have absolutely no access to a cash machine or in-person banking, which, of course, is a huge problem for older people, yeah. for um, people who cannot easily get around, cannot, um, cannot easily uh, use online. And even businesses, it, 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 it ramps up costs if they have to travel more to, 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 to do um, certain things in a bank. And the Mirror has a story saying that, you know, the government promised these banking hubs mm. that were meant to be put into post offices as a way of plugging the gap. Um, Labour is saying, you haven't rolled them out fast enough, we're going to do something faster. But for the life of me, I don't really understand why more pressure can't be put on banks to just have that element of social responsibility as opposed to just making money and saying, oh, well, we're losing money, therefore we're exactly. closing business as well. You're not losing that much money, I totally you? agree. And the decimation of the rural economy as well, and particularly elderly people who are caught in the middle of this, this links very nicely, actually, into the next uh, story, which is, when you first read it, is it, an extraordinary headline, Grand Theft Auto, security tags are being put on, wait for this, Werther's Originals what? and Slippers. Why is that, Anna? Uh, because we have the next uh, set of the shoplifting uh, um, epidemic. First it was the middle class shoplifters now we've got granny shoplifters oh. well it products where there's original slippers are now being tagged um and 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 some customers are saying what's going on are people shoving them on some <laughs> oap black market <laughs> so, so one of these the, these are the silver viewers. swipers oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> selling them on instagram yeah thank you i mean it, it's it's a i mean it just shows actually doesn't it james just how people are struggling actually but i mean you should never resort to doing uh, to nicking stuff out of shops yeah and uh, i don't understand the world is original why you'd steal world is original <laughs> is it They're like delicious. an addiction addiction problem? <laughs> no, oh, very good but we've only got 30 <laughs> seconds really quickly james uh, Page three of The Guardian. Uh, there's a storm in a teacup over vegan National Trust scones. Have scones gone woke? Yeah, so, I mean, a few days ago, the Daily Mail, I think it was, um, declared that margarine was a woke ingredient. Oh, because, stop um, it. The National Trust said... But stop it. National <laughs> Trust was using margarine instead of uh, butter in its scones, but... Apparently, it's oh, scones. you said scones. 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 You said scones. 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 <laughs> well. It's been doing this for years, though, so I'm, I'm not sure why People it's People are getting uh, their knickers in a twist over nothing everything nowadays. Yes. Well, there we go. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you uh, to you both. Anna, I'll get your name right now. Mihai Over. Is that right? No. Mihailova. Mihailova. Why scones. didn't you say right at the beginning? Mihailova eating scones. <laughs> Mihailova scones. <laughs> and thank you very much indeed. And James as well. Well, you've been getting in touch with your views and opinions all morning. Earlier we had that fascinating debate, didn't we, about whether or not mm. cannabis should be legalised in the UK. So... Medical cannabis is legalised, but not easily accessible. Correct. Right. So, so it has. It's very complicated to get it prescribed. I was talking to a lady yesterday actually, who's desperate for her child to have this, and who has intractable epilepsy, and it's almost impossible. But cannabis actually stops the seizures outright, but she cannot get hold of the drug. Incredible, isn't it? And many of you getting in touch as well about this. Uh, should cannabis be legalised in the UK? Gordon says, legalise it, tax it, and give that money to the NHS. That's what I said. And Will says, the amount of people you see or smell smoking it, it's basically legal already. Yeah. Very interesting indeed. Very interesting uh, indeed. Right, still to come on Talk Today. Have you ever wondered what happened behind the scenes on this set? Obviously, this is between Emily Maitlis and Prince Andrew. Did you wonder what happened there? Well, we're going to be speaking to photographer Mark Harrison, who captured the picture. Well, this is Talk Today. It is 8.44. Good morning. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. All Rosie. right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. It's a man.
Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Plymouth City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting the badge. Quite um, right too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now, you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I was just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss you. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. That's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> ah, a trans... Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> yeah. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist we're, we're, we're did fail to, her. Yeah, to it was another era. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 8.48 now. Highly anticipated Netflix drama Scoop is set for release this Friday, depicting a dramatised version of Prince Andrew's 2019 bombshell Newsnight interview. Well, the series starring Gillian Anderson as Emily Maitlis takes viewers behind the scenes as the BBC try to set up the interview. Here is a taster. The allegations surrounding Jeffrey Epstein include his friend Prince Andrew. Sam. Let's start pushing the palace. I want it for us. You're chasing a story that we're never going to get. This is the work. My job is booking the people we can't just call up. Hello, everyone. You have a problem that won't go away. We're looking at options. But there is a red line. If I do an interview, the question is, why you? With respect, you know how people see you. Spell it out. Whew, that yeah. looks very exciting indeed. Well, to give us an insight into that unforgettable interview, we are joined now by photographer Mark Harrison, who was there when it took place. Mark, good morning. Thank good you morning. so much good for joining morning. us. Pleasure. What was going through your mind when you were watching that interview? I was aghast, um, like everyone else was aghast, I suppose. But I, because it was live, I didn't know what was going to come next. So. Um, I was, uh, I had my hand over my mouth at one point. I, so. I'm sure you did, but can we just go back? Because you got a phone call, didn't you? And you didn't know what this assignment was, but you were told to polish your shoes. <laughs> yes, I was told to, to wear shiny shoes. I didn't know, and uh, I, I didn't know anything at all. Uh, literally, I was, I was about to turn the job down. I had a dishwasher coming, believe it or not. Of course. <laughs> and that seemed quite important. So I, I nearly turned it down. Um, and even when I took it, I still didn't know what I was doing. In fact, I didn't know what I was doing until I'm standing in the palace, outside the door, and I interrupt my host to say, excuse me, but I really don't know why I'm here. I have no idea. Who, who am I photographing and, and why? What's the story? <laughs> and then they said, oh, it's the, it's, it's the Duke of York. So, and then I had to think, the Duke of York, is that Andrew or Edward? So it's yeah. me double checking and also thinking, why? Why? What are they doing? What's the story? So trying to get it together in my head before I walked in the room. So obviously you were witnessing what was happening there between Andrew and Emily Maitlis, but what was going on behind the scenes? What was the atmosphere like between the producers and the crew that day? 
It was it was tense. Um, I mean, not in terms of Andrew, but in terms of the, of the crew and the, of the production, it was tense. Um, but we were told to carry on filming regardless of what happened. In fact, there was talk that he might even walk. Um, so we were just told, shoot, 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 and let's just see what happens. So they knew potentially how explosive this was going to be going into They it, did, I didn't, walk. but um, I'm picking it all up as, I, as it goes along, but, I can't. But, but in many ways, they played quite a clever game, hadn't they? So Andrew arrived early. Hmm. He, didn't he then take you on a tour of the palace? Not of the palace. He took me over. He took us on a the crew on a sort of tour down the marble hallway and talked about the paintings and the columns. So and... very relaxed. Very relaxed, yeah. And then Emily Maitlis arrived very late, just before the yeah, interview yeah. began. Do you think that was on purpose? I thought so at the time. I have no idea whether it was on purpose or not. But it seemed like a very astute thing to do um, to remove all the small talk and to make sure it was <laughs> just a sort of. Uh, engagement based on the detail, not on any sort of friendship or any charm or anything. It was, sure. it was perfect. Yeah. So when so the interview starts and you're you're witnessing this interview, and then you start to watch what he's doing and those questions, and there must have been a moment when you suddenly thought this isn't going very well for him. Um, well, in fact, it wasn't even going very well before it started because they had left in all the breakfast at the back of the shot. So I actually stood up before the interview started <laughs> and just told everyone to stop. One, because I needed my pictures, and two, because they'd left the breakfast in the shot. So right. uh, everyone <laughs> fell about laughing, including Prince Andrew. And, so um, you were the icebreaker. It was an icebreaker. Yeah, when the thing got going, I, my eyeline just remained fixed on the cameraman. I was standing just behind one of the cameramen and uh, I could see the other one on the other side and uh, I was just fixed on catching his eye and eyebrows went up and <laughs> hands went across mouths. I was going to and... say, what was the point at which, do you remember, that you oh, put Pizza your Oh, Pizza Express. Pizza Express working. Yeah, Pizza Express working. Um, that was a moment and I thought then that's a headline and then another one came and it was like, oh, that's a headline. Um, I certainly didn't know it was going to be a headline five years on, but... Um, but here we are. But here um, we are. He thought that the interview went rather well, yes. didn't he? Yes. How did he express that? <laughs> we, we took a final picture uh, going back down the marble corridor. They use it at the beginning of the interview, but we shot it at the end. Yeah. And we, I'm, I'm running backwards taking the photograph. Um, is this the photograph we can see up on the screen to your left-hand side there? Uh, that's the one, That's yeah, the one, yeah. okay. So I'm reversing at high speed. You can see, if you, you can see him almost running. So that's running actually there. after the interview? That's after the interview. Wow. Uh, he's smiling, everything's so, good. So look at Emily Maitlis's face. She knows. Oh, so a picture paints a thousand words. She knows that interview is, is a bombshell. She was tense at the end. All my photographs taken after the interview. There's no smiles, there's, no, there's nothing. It's all tense from her. Um, and in fact, during that photograph, I'm trying to stop them run. He, he, you can see he's almost running. I'm yeah. backing away. We end up in a huddle at the end of the corridor, a bizarre huddle with myself, Emily, and, and Prince Andrew. At which point, uh, he says to her, "Well, that was that was just terrific, wasn't it? That was wonderful. That went really well." And she she pauses and she says, "Yes, sir." That that that, that Did was. Did she say uh, yes? Yeah, she said yes, sir. That was <laughs> it went a really well for her. That was that was a walk in the park. Yeah. And there's a sort of tumbleweed moment as I'm squashed between the two of them. <laughs> and eventually he says, ah, yes, the park, New York, the park. And uh, he picks up on her little On gag. her mention of, of his walk in the park yeah. with Jeffrey Epstein. But at that moment I thought, I can't believe you thought this went well, because the rest <laughs> of us are all catching eyes and I'm told to just get out and get it to press. Do you photograph a lot of royals? Or was this the I first have time? Done, I, I've, I've done Queen Camilla um, mm -hmm. for a magazine, but mm -hmm. I, I... No, not really. It's not really... I, I'm a celebrity portrait photographer. I do mostly um, high-profile media people, um, but I've not done this. And I'm, I normally work with lights and assistants and setting up, and this is just one of those ones where you just have to kind of make the best of what you've got. And which side booked you? BBC booked me. BBC booked you, okay. Yeah. But they booked me the last minute. Uh, a friend of mine couldn't do it and he passed me on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I had. And you were waiting for how the dishwasher. He, and... How does he feel about that now, having passed <laughs> yeah. it on to you? I sent him a bottle of champagne oh, yesterday. Oh, good. <laughs> so, so, so you leave the palace with this photograph. You must have thought, I better get this developed. Uh, the producer said, You've got two hours, you've just seen a little piece of history get out and get it to me. And I felt about as under pressure as I've ever done in all my years uh, to get it sorted, delivered, and to wait to see what happened the following day. And really quickly, there's someone playing you, actually, in this Netflix is, yes. drama. Um, we'll obviously have yes. to wait and see what if that 
becomes part of the the story yeah, that I'm they. I'm not sure. I think I'm a very, very, very minor part in it. But I understand there is a there is a terrific actor, Gavin Spokes, who's who's playing me. Oh, um, wonderful! So I'll wait to see it like the rest of us. Oh. E extraordinary! And actually, the, those pictures are beautiful. I must just say about the lighting, oh, the way you. you've constructed them, everything about them. When you look at them now and you see this is a moment in history, how does that make you feel? Mm. It makes me very grateful for the opportunity. I, I'm 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 you know I. I just have to treat everything like it's going to be the most important thing I ever do. So, well, there's I'm a lesson thrilled. to you. Never stay in to wait for a dishwasher delivery. That's Always <laughs> say yes to the job. I totally agree. Really, so nice to meet you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark. Really brilliant. Thank you very much to Mark there. Scoop, of course, is going to be released on Netflix this Friday. Well, lots more still to come on the show. We'll speak to legendary photographer Arthur Edwards. He had his lens on the king over Easter weekend during His Majesty's first public appearance since his cancer diagnosis. This is Talk Today, the time, 8.56. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat, go. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest, when a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, a trans woman is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. And I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right too. Yay. Quite Yay. right too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia, reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <miss him. laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I, know it's, I know it's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue, then. Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just, 40 yeah. minutes, 40. Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, it put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist did fail her. We're supposed to, fail her. We're supposed to move on from era. that. She was 22. Mm. We're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. This is Talk Today with David Ball and Nicola Thorpe. Good morning to you. It is 9 o'clock on Tuesday, the 2nd of April. Yo, we talk today on TV, radio, online, and, of course, on your smart speaker, your top stories this morning. A British citizen is among seven foreign aid workers killed in an airstrike in Gaza. Our footage emerges, revealing the destruction of the Strip's major hospitals. The cost of chaos, Labour attacks the government's spending record, claiming the Tories have wasted more than £8 billion. But do their calculations add up?
And as more details emerge of Netflix's upcoming drama Scoop, we'll talk to legendary photographer Arthur Edwards for his take on Prince Andrew's infamous Newsnight interview. It's an unsettled and increasingly windy week. Today, cold with some rain for eastern Scotland, elsewhere a few showers, but watch out for wet weather in the south later. Cheers, Isabel. Now it's time for your headlines with Emily. Thank you, Nicola. Good morning. We begin with a developing story this hour. Three children have been injured in a school shooting in Finland. Police were called to a primary school located north of Helinski and an investigation is underway. A suspect who's understood to be a minor has been detained and locals have been told to stay away from the area. We'll keep you updated on that story. A British aid worker has been killed in what's reported to have been an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. He's one of seven volunteers for the charity World Central Kitchen who died in the attack. The others were Polish and Australian nationals. From Jerusalem, hostage negotiator Gershon Buskins told Talk Today it's a huge tragedy. In any case, in any place in the world when aid workers are killed, it, it is very serious. The Israelis really need to conduct an investigation to find out how this was allowed to happen and certainly needs to take responsibility for it. Meanwhile, Israel's military has pulled out of Al Shifa hospital after a two week raid that's left it in ruins. Israel claims to have killed and arrested hundreds of terrorists. The Labour Party claims conservative turmoil under Rishi Sunak has cost the taxpayer £8.2 billion and nearly a year in lost time. This morning, Labour's unveiled a website called The Cost of Chaos, which includes a bill calculating the cost of by-elections, ministerial reshuffles and policy U-turns, like scrapping the northern leg of HS2 during Rishi Sunak's time as Prime Minister. Well, the shadow chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster, Pat McFadden, has told Talk Today their calculations are cautious. It adds up to billions of pounds and it won't stop because they never stop. They're already manoeuvring around Rishi Sunak now. Uh, the leadership candidates are already plotting. And if the Tories were to win the next election, this kind of thing and this cost would all simply carry on. And Donald Trump's avoided having his assets seized after posting a $175 million bond in his civil fraud case. The former U.S. president was at risk of having prime real estate like Trump Tower and his Mar-a-Lago estate taken away from him. In February, he was found guilty of scheming to deceive banks and insurers by inflating his wealth. You're up to date with the headlines. I'll have another update at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much indeed, Emily. On to our top story this morning. A British aid worker is amongst seven people killed in an airstrike in Gaza last night. Well, staff from World Central Kitchen died when their car was struck by a missile in Deir al-Bala. Well, Israel's military said it is conducting a thorough review into the tragic incident. Now, earlier on, we spoke to Noga Tarnopolsky, an independent journalist in Jerusalem, who told us they're still waiting for authorities to provide more information. The Israeli army acknowledges that it was probably an Israeli strike that killed um, these aid workers and that it is in the middle of, a, of an investigation looking into it. It's just been a few hours. But the non-denial I take basically is an admission. And what we haven't heard yet is what they were doing there. So that we haven't heard the army say, for example, you know, we regret the error, but the bomb was aimed at X, or we thought we were doing Y. So we just don't know yet what may have happened. Uh, so that's Noga Tarnopolsky, an independent journalist in Jerusalem there. Uh, lots of messages coming in as uh, well. Uh, we, we were talking earlier about the cost of chaos, of course, and this is Labour's great reveal this morning, saying the Conservative Party is costing a lot of money. Uh, one of the things that they said was surely the government should have called the general election at the same time as the local elections. We've asked you, should they have done exactly that? Well, Maeve says, well, I dread the next election. Getting the Tories and the SNP out is one thing. Thing, but replacing them with Labour would be preposterous. Darcy says, I think it would be significantly better for the Labour Party to come up with a set of cohesive policies rather than entertain us with campaign attack drama. Very interesting.
Very interesting indeed. Let's move on to Westminster now. And the government says that it is delivering on its childcare plan, with the first parents in England now benefiting from 15 hours of taxpayer-funded care for two-year-olds. Well, Rishi Sunak says that the scheme will help families and grow the economy, but Labour is predicting that parents will struggle to find places. Well, we're joined by our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, also Aubrey Allegretti from The Times. Uh, Alicia, we spoke earlier, and on the face of it, actually, this is good news for parents. So this was an announcement made in 2023. And at the time, of course, on face value, it is a really, really good announcement for parents. I mean, childcare in the UK is notoriously expensive compared to various places in Europe, for example. And it's one of the main barriers for lots of parents actually going to work. For lots of families, it's seen as way more viable to have one parent out of work and looking after children of, of this age than to send a child to nursery because it's so expensive. So this announcement was um, to extend the 15 hours of free childcare that, th that children aged three and four get to two-year-olds and then further down the line to five, um, all children under five. And the issue with it, though, is that there are just simply not enough nursery places for all of these children to actually go to mm. and not enough childminders either. Aubrey, uh, Labour's criticisms of uh, this policy, are they fair? Is it just another run-up to the general election swipe at the government? Well, I think they are echoing the concerns of some parents who certainly won't be able to get their first choice or maybe second choice of nursery. Um, and, you know, if this is all about convenience, then they might argue, well, I would like to be able to send my child to the nursery down the road. But there are obviously those in government saying, you know, naturally there are going to be teething problems, but the take up has been pretty good so far. Ministers, as I understand, are poised to basically announce that they think they've hit about 150,000 sign-ups, mm. which was the target Gillian Keegan set for herself by early April. They were hoping internally to hit it by the 1st of April, and they said, basically, if we hadn't had a bank holiday, we think we'd have hit it. Right. But we will find out, basically, in about two weeks' time how successful the sort of sign-up for this scheme has mm. been. Mm. And then, of course, there is the next big sort of milestones this September and next September as it's extended down. So whether or not the government can sort of hold this together and drive up the capacity that Alicia was talking about in the providers, that's the unknown here. Now, there's a great article in The Times by someone called um, Aubrey Allegretti mm. this morning. <laughs> um, a, really, a really interesting um, article, actually, about what's going on with the Tory party. We know that, actually, according to the news yesterday, they may be left with, what, 98 MPs. Pretty devastating. You, you are talking in this article about uh, the pop con about trying to install a trust-style leader if the party loses the general election. That's right. So there is this sort of thinking going on at a very sort of low level in the Conservative Party about who should replace Rishi Sunak. Now, very few people think the Prime Minister is going to be turfed out of office this side of a general election. But if it's sort of round the corner, only about six months away, then it's sensible, really, so the theory goes, amongst <laughs> potential leadership candidates to start thinking about how to sort of lay the ground for trying to succeed him. And the Popcons group was obviously launched by uh, Liz Truss two months ago in February. Lee Anderson was also there. <laughs> he didn't stick around for He's very long. He's now somewhere else. <laughs> so it's, it's not necessarily a Conservative group with a capital C. It's a Conservative group with a sort of lowercase c, right? It's a collection of people who believe that the Conservative Party has abandoned or isn't living up to Conservative values. And there is now this search on for a sort of Liz Truss-style leader, somebody who shares her sort of economic... Uh, free market, libertarian agenda to try and replace Rishi So you mean a Conservative? Mm. Well, that, that is the <laughs> argument, right. yes. And who's the current front-runner? So there are obviously, you know, the election is a long way away. Priti Patel is somebody whose name has been sort of spoken okay. about to me as somebody who the Popcons could get behind. Interestingly enough, you remember in the last few days, the One Nation Conservatives were also starting to talk about her as well. So the former Home Secretary seems to be attracting some of this appeal. But we saw how that went for Penny Mordaunt as well. So maybe it's not best to have your name. Well, what, do you, what do you think about that, Alicia? So you've got all these factions vying. We've got the local elections yeah. coming up as well. Of course, that could be a big benchmark for Rishi Sunak. What are you hearing? I mean, I, I totally echo everything that you're saying in that Priti Patel has kind of been someone who has taken a bit of a back foot recently. She's kind of stayed out of the drama. She's not been one of the people that have been really loud about what her plans are for the future, but she's definitely someone that people are thinking about to be the next Conservative Party leader. And she's someone who does seem to please both the right and the, the more centrist um, members of the Conservative Party at the moment. Lots of people saying that she'd actually be a pretty good bet because at the moment we've got Penny Morden, an, another option. She's uh, towards the left of the party, so that kind of isn't brilliant for those on the right. And then we've got Kemi Badenoch, who's on the right of the party, which isn't brilliant for those on the left, whereas Pretty Patel's a bit more... 
easy for them the both the both yeah. yeah. I, I, I see, not... No, I see what you mean because she's she's gone quiet over the past couple of years, I guess. But the biggest policy that I would say the Tories have failed on for the past year has been the Rwanda policy. She introduced it, and yet she's not really spoken about it for the past couple of years. Is she mortified? Does she wish that she'd never done it, or is she just? keeping quiet so that she's no longer connected. I'd imagine that the way that she would kind of spin this is that the way that the Rwanda policy has played out not after how she, she left would have done not it. how she would have yeah. done it. And that's exactly what she has said. Well, 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 well it's interesting because, Alicia, you and I were talking about, well, all three of us were talking earlier about the cost of chaos from Labour, yeah. of course. And, Aubrey, just in terms of that, I mean, I, I find it a bit rich. I don't know what you make of the figures they've been talking about, these cost of chaos. It's a bit rich when Labour has been blocking what the Conservative Party have been trying to do when sorting out uh, the immigration crisis in this country? So I think some of the figures are maybe more fair than others. So certainly when you look at the cost of the by-elections, the average cost of those is about £250,000. And I think there have been eight. Uh, <laughs> so they're, they're sort of blaming on this kind of sleaze and, and scandal. So, you know, some of those costs, I think, are probably uh, more fair. And they've included things like the £15,000 sum that Michelle Donnellan had to pay yeah. in order to settle yeah. this dispute. But um, obviously, there are people now questioning what a Labour government would do, how cohesive the party would be once it got into government, and whether it might be, you know, attracted to this same level of chaos. I mean, maybe mm. the same level is a bit far, but, you know, would it all be hunky-dory if Keir Starmer got into number 10? Mm. I mean, well, it's a great question also, Aubrey. Just on that note, what about the Muslim vote? Keir Starmer is really not out of the woods here at all. Shabana Mahmood has said Labour has lost the trust of the Muslim voter. Alyssa and I uh, were talking earlier and saying... And, and, you, and your view very much was that actually this is a big problem for Labour. I think it's, it's basically it's very hard to quantify. I mean, there have been surveys of quite small samples done which seek to say that, you know, Muslim voters are really being turned off the Labour Party, particularly over its stance over Gaza. Keir Starmer has obviously got Labour into a more cohesive position on the war between Hamas and Israel mm. and, you know, then got into the position where Labour could support this amendment calling for an immediate ceasefire, which is the position that they wanted to get to, albeit three or four months after this issue was originally raised. But the local elections will be probably a really good sort of barometer of that strength of feeling and whether or not there are Muslim voters kind of not turning out, whether they're supporting another party or whether Labour can, you know, afford to sort of ruffle some feathers, but ultimately is still on track to win the election. And I've been making the point, making the point all morning that, you know, you don't have to be Muslim to care about what's happening in Gaza, nor do you have to be Jewish to care about what's happening to the hostages. But it seems that that, that certainly demographic seem to be turning away from the Labour Party, as do other non-Muslim people who feel very, very strongly about Palestinians. Definitely. And I think losing the Muslim vote might be a big deal for the Labour Party, but I don't think it's going to be the be-all and end-all about them winning or losing the election. I think, realistically, they are so far ahead in, in the polls at the moment. Yeah. And, and although it would be a knock to them, it's not going to actually cost them the election. But what we have seen is definitely a growing feeling amongst people in the public. And as you say, Nicola, not just Muslims, just, just people, anyone from any nationality, mm -hmm. any religion, feeling like maybe the Labour Party don't actually speak for their values and that they want to look elsewhere. But the question is, where is that? place. Very interesting indeed. Well, thank you to our political correspondent, Alicia Fitzgerald, for joining us all morning, and Aubrey Allegretti from The Times. Well, still to come. King Charles was in Windsor over Easter in his first public appearance since his cancer diagnosis. Well, royal photographer Arthur Edwards captured this picture of him and joins us next. Well, we'll see that picture in a minute. This is Talk Today. <laughs> the time is 9.30. Stay with us. picture. <laughs> Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't Talk. gonna have an eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. All right, oi, oi, treat girl. When JK Rowling says, let's just be honest, it's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Is a man. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Quite yay. right, too. 
It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. Now you might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get. This. <laughs> but 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 I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh, Ooh. It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, <Where is> it? <laughs> There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the mm. fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> so he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, <laughs> a trans sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So anyway, <laughs> just yeah. minute, four... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Yeah, but for her to say, come out and vote, and by the way, t when I was 22 years old and I had an affair with a married man that I knew was married, the feminist failed me. I'm sorry. I think like, the feminist what, what did fail her. We're supposed to, supposed to was have another moved on from era. That. She was 22, mm. we're supposed to have moved on from that. Don't hark back on no. something you did that was wrong. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to Talk Today. The time is 9.17. Now, King Charles has made his first public appearance over the Easter weekend since announcing his cancer diagnosis earlier this year. Speaking to crowds after attending a service in Windsor, of course, with Queen Camilla. Well, the King has continued some work since his diagnosis, but all engagements so far have taken place in private. Well, we're now joined by royal photographer Arthur Edwards, who captured the occasion. Arthur, really good to see you. Of course, uh, you're a very well-known figure. You've photographed many royals over yeah. the years. When you saw when you saw the king and and the photograph that you took of the king, how did you feel he looked? Well, I, I was quite amazed. I thought he looked remarkably well, and uh, and you know I haven't seen him since Christmas Day when when he was at Sandringham Church Service, and uh, when he got out the car. We all expected him to walk for a start, and he didn't. He arrived by car. When he got out of the car, he turned and, and he gave this amazing wave and, and a big smile. And there was this lady next to me in the crowd screaming about him, and, and he sort of smiled at her. And <laughs> uh, and, uh, and he looked terrific. And then afterwards, you know, he we were we were warned by his staff that there may be a walkabout, so mm -hmm. I was expecting it. And uh, that lady you see there in the pink, I mean, she said to him. Oh, she said, my dog Camilla, 17 year old, 17 year old. And he turned around and said, it's time you got a new one. <laughs> <laughs> and so his humour was still there. And, yeah. uh, and I really, uh, I thought it was uh, just a, a great walkabout. And, I, and it was, and, and Camilla was just looking amazing, but also totally supportive. You know, she was with him all the way as she has been since they got married. And lots yeah. of them were wearing green, I believe, as a nod to yeah. Macmillan yeah, cancer support. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was definitely a united front, wasn't it? It was, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it, it was great. Um, sadly, you know, Catherine and William yes. and the children weren't mm. there, but, you know, they've got their own problems. And so they're sort of bonding a bit again and, and, and trying to spend some time with their mother and reassuring the children that she's going to be OK. Yeah. And of yes. course, um, I, I think many people were surprised he did a walkabout. I think many of us expected him not to do that. Uh, we were told about a mini light service, for example. But and, and you're right there. I think Queen Camilla has blossomed. Yeah. Oh my God, she's been a star. You know, she's been filling in for him quite a lot. You know, yeah. doing jobs with him. And and we're quite worried about D-Day. You know, this year because that's the last one, the 80th anniversary. And I know he wants to be there, but you know, Camilla will do the job for him. You know, she'll go and she'll she'll. Uh, you know, go to Normandy and, 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 and do it for him if he doesn't. But, you know, I just hope he does make it because he will be so sad to miss that. And, of course, Prince Andrew was in attendance at that church service. Yeah. Um, he's had 
a very interesting few years, to say the least. We were talking to a photographer earlier who photographed his interview with Emily Maitlis. What do you make of his presence at events like this? Because we know he's a royal who has not got the favour of the British public, but he seems to be, you know, very much making these public appearances and seems to have been accepted again with the family. Well, I don't think he was ever out with the family. I think he was withdrawn from public life because of the... Uh, what went on, and mainly because of that interview. The interview was his downfall, in my view. If he'd have said in that... Or if he'd have said in that interview, mm. look, I'm sorry, I did that, and uh, I, I regret it, I was lonely, I was divorced, uh, and I made a mistake. If he'd have said that, I think it would have been OK. But going on about, you know, he doesn't sweat and he's at Pizza Express and, yeah. and all these things, you know, it was just... Um, it was really stupid of him, but, you know, and I, I quite like Prince Andrew, as I say. Over the years, I've worked with him many times, and uh, he's been amazing for me. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's interesting, you, you know, having worked with these royals, you do strike up quite a relationship. I know that you've done that with many royals over, yeah. over the years. How would you describe Andrew then? Because obviously we're reading the headlines, we're hearing about Pizza Express, Woking, yeah, Black yeah, West yeah. and stuff. What is he really like? He's a, he's a very... He's a bit arrogant. I mean, I must say, that's his, probably his downfall. That was his problem on the interview, mm. his arrogance. But, you know, he's a really nice person. I mean, I, you know, I, can't, I haven't got time to list all the kindnesses he's shown me, but I remember mm. once when, when I got my MBE off the Queen, he came out somewhere in the palace to thank... You know, to, to you know, sort of congratulate me, and, and I found that nice. And then once on a... I was covering a trip with him to Vietnam and I had to get to New York quickly, and he said, oh, I'll, I'll give you a lift on my plane to Bangkok, you know, wow. and he did that, you know. He didn't have to do that, but he's kind. He's, he's kind and, you know, and going to church, you know, I mean, I go to church quite a lot. Yeah. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's a place where you can get comfort and, you know, why shouldn't he? And, and why, I mean, it's the king's brother, for God's sake. Yeah. He's not, you know, he's not like he's... But you'd also understand that the British public was seeing a man who, you know, appears to have lied but, you on know... occasion and on very serious things, you know, a, a friendship with a convicted sex offender, yeah. paedophile, um, you know, these very questionable trips to various places um, in the company of dubious characters. You can yeah. understand why the British public oh, feel understand. like he shouldn't have a place in, in their, yeah. you know, a role of, you know, the brother of the head of state. Sure, I agree. But, you know, there, there is that to it. But, you know, at the same time, everybody's got something in their life that they regret and, and doing and, you know, and would be ashamed if it was made public. And he's had that to him, you know, mm -hmm. and... And, and the punishment that he's suffering, I think, is worse than the crime, you know. I think, what, what I think, you know, he is basically a decent person, a decent family man, a good father, and uh, I just feel, you know... I think in many ways, yeah. we, should, we should do what the King's doing, you know, forgive, and, uh, and think, well, maybe we've all done something... I'm um, sorry, what was lives. the... When you said the, the punishment's worse than the crime, what's the punishment there the and, punishment, and the crime? He's, he's lost everything. He's lost all his... Right. His, his army... Uh, he was colonel-in-chief of some regiments. He's lost all that. He doesn't and do any public duties. And the crime he was punished for... And the, the crime was... I think the crime was the lies he told on, yeah. on the Maitlis interview. I think that was the worst thing he did. Mm. If, if... You know, what he did with Epstein and what he did with alleged with these girls, you know, that's, that was a mistake... And, and, you know, we all make mistakes in life. And, uh, but, the, but telling the lies and the arrogance of the interview, you know, where he said, oh, I think that very well, didn't it? You know, I mean... The arrogance of The arrogance that of it was, was okay. just... Um, Fascinating. Yeah, was, was the worst thing he did. But you know what? At... Will you be watching the Netflix special on, uh, on Friday? I probably will, yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. you will. You yeah. know you will. You've got that. Yeah. You yeah. know you will. Um, so, so very nice to talk to you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Indeed. What a wonderful photograph you took of King yeah. Charles. Yeah, well, you know, he's my hero anyway. And, and, and it's great to hear that you think the King is in good health as well. Yeah, he is. I really think he's doing Thank, well, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. To Arthur Edwards there. That's all from us here on Talk Today. We'll see you tomorrow from 6 o'clock. Well, Kevin and Alex are up next. But first, here is the weather with Isabel. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather.
is looking unsettled again this week with further low pressure systems coming in from the southwest. In fact, you can see this wet weather pushing in across the south through the course of today. Looks as though it'll be a miserable afternoon and evening. Ahead of that, some showers, but some bright spells. Coldest weather where we keep that persistent rain in central and eastern Scotland. And here, quite a chilly east or northeasterly wind. Elsewhere, it is quite mild. Temperatures into the mid teens in places. We keep that wet weather in the northeast tonight, bit of snow for higher ground. Elsewhere, it's this low driving the rain northwards that we're talking about. So, quite wet weather developing for many central areas. The brighter yellow showing the heavier burst running up through Wales into the Midlands and then eventually up into uh, northern England. Really horrible, actually, out there. In the south, though, it'll turn a bit bit drier by morning, but it will be mild, as you can see. Temperatures no lower than around 10 in the south. On Wednesday, then, we get that wet weather stuck across central areas. Uh, quite heavy rain and not particularly tr nice if you're travelling. Uh, local flooding possible as well. Driest across the far northwest of Scotland and also in the south. It should turn a bit drier through the afternoon with some brighter spells and a high of 12 to 15. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. Now, you ain't going to happen and eve it, me old Chinas, but a new report is calling for a new definition of cockney. All right, Jeremy, me old China. Rosie. Right, oi, oi, treat girl. Having a conversation with a professional journalist, he chose to belittle her, diminish her, um, and use sexist language. I can't stand the word casual sexism. There's nothing casual about igniting and using kind of diminishing and belittling language about anyone, especially someone who's trying to do her job. When J.K. Rowling says, let's just be honest, that's all she's saying, let's just be honest. When a man goes out and kills, we should talk about them as what they are, a biological man. And when the media constantly refer to trans criminals, when they are biological men as women, we will no longer put up with these lies about our gender anymore and about our sex. Trans woman, it's not a woman, trans woman. Lee would have to go for much further than his statement. I mean, he, he did say that he spoke clumsily and he understood the Prime Minister's position, but I think he'd need to say that he'd got it wrong. I, that's robust. It's going to cause a, an argument. It's going to cause tension. But we've got to do it, because otherwise this country is going down the path. Then I had a phone call this morning um, from Kim City Council, a lovely woman called Anna. And yeah, I've just received an email just saying, um, that, yeah, I'm going to be getting a badge. Quite um, right, too. Yeah. Quite yeah. right, too. It's that time again to get the violins out. That's right. Prince Harry has lost his bid for UK security after moaning he'd been singled out. They might as well be discussing an invasion of Daleks for all I really get this. <laughs> but, but, but I am now on social media having been dragged off my eight-pound Nokia reluctantly kicking and screaming. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge hit on Instagram, as you probably know. One parent commented on a review of Peppa Pig that their daughter had begun to lash out since watching the show and added that Peppa is rude, bossy, a liar, tattletale and even more. Say it's not so. What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen. There was a suggestion by some that maybe it would be nice to put a statue of the Queen on the fourth plinth. Mr. Khan apparently wasn't too keen on that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Huh? I know what's I know what's coming and I can't stop laughing. So he suggested alternatives. There's a sweet potato. Uh, that's quite a small statue then. <laughs> Wasn't there also a prostitute? <laughs> oh, a trans. Sex worker. You don't really need one of those in Trafalgar Square. You've just got to walk up to Soho. So <laughs> <Just 40 laughs> minutes, 40... Why do you know this? Because yeah. I know everything. Uh, was he just unlucky getting that question with an ice cream, or is it a sign of something more? Seemed like he was on a uh, late night show to attract a young demographic, and uh, they put him in an ice cream store. And once you get defeated by a guy named Begley, that's <laughs> it. You retire from politics, and you stick to Rosanna on primetime and have a lot more fun. I read the statement this morning from the family. And if any police officer reads that statement, if you don't cry for what you read from what the family is saying, it's heartbreaking, then you shouldn't be a police officer. The UK, I'd say, has lots of racism within it. I don't necessarily think it's a racist country, but it permeates our institutions. Then I'm trying to say